The following message is best viewed on an oscilloscope. Thanks. I um, I do like that jingle. I, I feel that every time I watch it on uh, on Zoom, I get to see slightly different frames. It's quite challenging for um, live video streaming. So welcome everyone to the fourth uh, computing and data handling uh, parallel track. We're track 14 in iChat this year. So we have a very interesting program uh, this morning. We're looking at event generation and simulation in the first part of the session and then we'll turn to machine learning um, in the middle section and finally we'll look at um, offline computing uh, with three of the LHC experiments uh, <coughs> results to us. So we'll kick off uh, the morning with uh, Marco Rossi who is going to tell us about uh, PDF flow. So Marco take it away. Yes, can you see the screen? Yep. Okay, great. You want to good put morning. it full screen? Yeah, now it's good. Yeah. Okay, fine. <clears throat> so, good morning, everyone. This is PDF Flow, uh, hardware accelerating parton density access. I'd like to introduce the concept of uh, parton uh, distribution functions with a physical example. Here you have uh, in the plot uh, the diagram for uh, proton proton interactions at uh, LHC in particular the X boson uh, uh, production via gluon fusion channel. And QCD uh, tells us how to compute the uh, cross-section for this process um, via the formula uh, of the convolution uh, of two uh, PDFs, FA and FB, that takes into account uh, long distance behavior of the physics with uh, a parton level uh, cross section sigma hat. The two um, PDFs are functions of two arguments, x and q squared. x is the fraction of momentum of the parton, of the incoming parton with respect to the, inc uh, the parent proton, and q squared is a typical uh, energy scale of the hard process. The evolution of uh, the PDF. Uh, with respect to Q squared is driven by the famous uh, Diglap equation. And uh, as, you, as you know, uh, PDFs are essential for theoretical calculation since uh, they enter the calculation of the integral uh, seen before. Modern PDFs are uh, presented with the uncertainty bands that could slow down the convolution equation. Then uh, any improvement in a modern algorithm uh, is uh, well uh, welcome and uh, valuable in order to speed up the entire uh, computation. LHA PDF 6 is the state of the art uh, um, accessing tools for PDFs. It provides uh, official PDF sets that are uh, collections of uh, TXT files that uh, contains uh, several versions of uh, grids uh, of points in the x2 squared space for all the flavors uh, for the incoming uh, partons. An example here from the NMPDF uh, collaboration, you, you see that uh, some, uh, just a finite number of points are uh, um, presented in these, uh, in these files. So uh, in order to access all the points in the x2 squared space, some interpolation uh, method is needed um, inside the grid range uh, as well uh, for uh, um, some extrapolation method outside the grid range. 
LHA PDF has a, um, a Python interface that uh, allows one to create a PDF object and uh, fixing a PID, namely a flavor for the incoming uh, Python. It uh, allows uh, to query an XQ squared point and uh, return the corresponding value uh, for the PDF. Uh, this uh, this uh, LHA PDF6 algorithm is a um, sequential uh, algorithm. In fact, uh, it takes uh, into account this uh, accessing of the PDF uh, with, uh, with a loop, with a for loop. Uh, then, uh, but uh, as you can see, the, uh, each of these uh, calculations is intrinsically parallel. So uh, the query points are independent. We try to redesign uh, the LHA PDF6 algorithm and present uh, this uh, PDF flow tool in order to speed up the entire uh, PDF accessing uh, process, querying uh, not just uh, uh, points in the XQ square space, but uh, arrays of uh, uh, different sides. We have uh, in we introduced this um, Python uh, Python interface that returns uh, an array of values of the correspondent x uh, square, uh, square uh, q square uh, points for the PDF. And this uh, could uh, really benefit from uh, hardware acceleration, namely uh, running this uh, on uh, multi-threading uh, CPUs and the graphic processing units. In order to leverage uh, uh, this parallelization, we use the capabilities of the uh, TensorFlow library, which is an end-to-end -end open source platform for machine learning produced by Google. It has a rich Python API library, and uh, we uh, ensure uh, the compatibility of uh, our tool with the TensorFlow version 2. Also, the, the interesting point uh, in using TensorFlow is that uh, it uh, manages automatically the placement of tensors, which are the basic objects manipulated by TensorFlow library, onto uh, several platforms like CPUs and GPUs. So there's no need to go through specific codes uh, directly programming on GPUs that could uh, make the task uh, harder. TensorFlow has two execution modes in version uh, two, the eager mode, that takes uh, every line of the code and uh, uh, executes, compile and ex executes it uh, um, within a Python and uh, uh, a graph mode. We wanted to uh, explore this graph mode option that was uh, previously on TensorFlow 1, the default one, uh, but uh, in a TensorFlow 2 uh, version, you have this uh, uh, TF function which uh, uh, allow ones, one to wrap the usual eager code. So one codes into uh, the, usual, uh, the usual imperative way, but wrapping uh, the block with the TF function decorator, this uh, triggers a, a graph uh, building. A graph, TensorFlow graph, is a, a set of uh, operations, TensorFlow operation as nodes, as you can see in the picture and uh, they are connected uh, by edges uh, where, uh, flow, uh, where flow uh, tensor, tensors uh, between them. The graph is uh, really uh, par parallel and uh, is uh, really faster compared to the uh, eager mode. And uh, the only caveat to have in mind when uh, triggering this process is that uh, uh, some time takes uh, when uh, um, building the first time uh, the graph. So when calling the first time uh, the code uh, wrapped with the TF function. We uh, implemented the, the PDF flow tool and uh, <clears throat> tried to uh, match the accuracy of uh, the previous state of the art uh, uh, algorithm, LHA PDF. We present here uh, this uh, accuracy test with these two plots, uh, um, plotting the absolute relative difference and uh, putting a, an, accept, an acceptance error threshold 
of uh, 10 to the minus 3, according to the Lecce PDF6 paper. Uh, in the uh, left plot, uh, you have uh, some uh, uh, curves. In fact, there's only one um, with fixed uh, uh, Q values and uh, varying continuously the, uh, the X, uh, the X um, argument for the PDF. On the right one, on the right plot, you have the uh, opposite uh, uh, situation where we fixed the X and uh, changed the, the Q. As you can see here, you, you can see the other, the, uh, especially on the left, uh, the left plot, you can see the other uh, curves because uh, the match with the LHAPDF is uh, uh, almost perfect. We just have uh, this uh, uh, low Q uh, problem in the extrapolation algorithm. So not inside the grid, outside the, we are outside the, the grid given uh, in the PDF sets. But uh, yes, this uh, is, um, uh, there's, there are a small region where uh, the uh, absolute relative difference is above threshold, but this uh, could be not uh, so relevant since uh, these uh, such low values of uh, the energy scale are not frequently um, inspected by Monte Carlo integrators for high energy physics processes. The interesting point for uh, PDF uh, flow is the performance benchmark against LHA PDF. We run uh, uh, this benchmark uh, querying uh, a number, a different number of uh, points uh, sequentially for uh, LHA PDF and uh, up with a parallel approach for PDF flow. Here in the plot, in the main plot, you have um, different number of points from 10 to the fifth uh, from to uh, up to 10 to the sixth so 1 million of uh, uh, an array of 1 million of points and we and uh, as you can see uh, pdf flow outperforms uh, uh, lha pdf in uh, uh, performance times in the lower right plot you have the uh, absolute uh, relative uh, um, difference of uh, the timings and uh, we claim a se around a 72% of relative improvement. On this, uh, this is run on uh, CPU uh, with the Intel i9 uh, with 36 cores for uh, um, the two, the two, the bo both the two algorithms. algorithms. More inter interestingly uh, is the situation when, run, uh, when we run uh, PDF flow on GPU uh, of course, LHA PDF could be run just on CPU, but uh, here you, you see that the, the difference in the terms of uh, performance is uh, dramatically improved. You have uh, 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 90, around a 98 uh, uh, best relative improvement, uh, just as uh, shown in the lower right plot. And uh, we are really happy to for uh, happy to see these uh, these improvements compared to the LHP, LHA PDF uh, algorithm. We implemented also another feature for the uh, PDF flow tool, which is the strong uh, running coupling. In fact, uh, Alpha S is presented into PDF sets uh, as a grid uh, of points in the Q space. Uh, this could be seen as the one-dimensional problem of the uh, task previously uh, seen for the PDFs. And uh, we claim an exact matching between the PDF flow and the LHA PDF uh, analog uh, interpolator. Here in the plot, you can see the, uh, how, how the strong uh, running coupling changes with the, with the Q uh, argument. We implemented uh, um, two physical examples in order to show the uh, capabilities of uh, PDF flow. The, single, the first is the single top production uh, threading order that is presented uh, by this uh, uh, Feynman diagram here, which uh, takes into account the process of QQ bar into B bar into a and the top. We, for this process, we combined the PDF flow, so the uh, accessing tool for PDFs with Vegas flow, which is a Monte Carlo integrator that has been presented yesterday by uh, my colleague, 
and uh, it relies on the same philosophy of uh, PDF flow, so massive uh, parallelization and uh, um, usage and, and, uh, and leveraging uh, with the TensorFlow capabilities. Three minutes, Marco. Okay, yes, it's the last slide. Uh, this, um, in this slide, you have uh, the speed comparison of uh, uh, PDF flow plus Vegas flow run on two, two different platforms, CPU and GPU. As you can see, the CPU Intel i9 is the, takes uh, around uh, five seconds and uh, all the GPUs outperforms uh, uh, the CPU. The speed up range uh, is, uh, takes uh, into account a factor of seven uh, to a factor of uh, around 10 for uh, these uh, performance improvements. Uh, the second example is the vector boson fusion um, for uh, the X production at next to leading order. We are happy to say, to say that this is the first, uh, um, this is the first exa physical example at next to leading order, uh, all ported on uh, GPU. So uh, this is uh, achieved with, uh, again, with PDF flow and Vegas flow. In this, uh, in this plot on the right, uh, you, you, we compare the uh, performance on uh, CPU for the state of the art code at next to leading order, LHA PDF, plus a fortunate implementation of the Monte Carlo integrator that takes uh, uh, around 360 seconds on uh, a consumer grade uh, Intel i7 CPU. The situation is better for uh, LHA PDF and Fortran code for a professional grade hardware on Intel i9, but, uh, the, but is not uh, optimal since it, uh, it's outperformed by the uh, GPU implementation of PDF flow and Vegas flow combined. Here, the speed up at next to leading order is around a factor of uh, eight for uh, consumer grade with respect to the best uh, setup for the GPUs and a factor of three for the professional grade hardware. So uh, in conclusion, we presented PDF flow, which is the first port, GPU port for uh, PDF interpolation. We benchmarked against uh, LHA PDF six for performance and accuracy, we achieved uh, big speed up around uh, one, one, uh, 100% on GPUs. We implemented the, the alpha strong running coupling interpolation and provided uh, two applica uh, application examples at either at leading order and an next to leading order. We claim that Vegas flow and PD flow outperform standard CPU algorithms uh, for either consumer and professional grade GPUs. The code is, has been uh, recently um, released and uh, so it's public and available at the uh, GitHub repository of uh, entry PDF. Also the DOI is uh, available as this link, at this link. So let me uh, thank um, my colleagues uh, to contribute to this uh, uh, work and all the, uh, the people who's uh, following this presentation. Uh, thank you very much. That's great. Thanks very much, Marco. Um, so we're open for questions now. Andy has raised his hand. So anybody else that wants to ask a question, just raise your hand in Zoom. Andy, go ahead. Hi. First of all, I think very nice to see this happening. Uh, yeah, uh, having having the event generation as the obvious candidate on, on, on accelerated hardware appearing. I think this is, is great for the field. Uh, the, the, uh, the obvious question to, 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 to something like this is how, how likely is it to abstract the actual technology in, in, uh, in, in the code, being, saying we know now AMD, Flood, floods the market with GPUs, blah, blah, blah. Uh, how, how likely do you see that we find some sort of a, a let's say, meta programming style that, uh, that's the adoption to different 
actually acceleration hardware is, uh, is, is, is not so painful for us? Well, uh, yesterday, the colleague of mine presented Vegas Flow and pointed that the main uh, drawback uh, of this, uh, the advantage that, that uh, CPU code is that is around uh, uh, for uh, a long time. So uh, the codes and the document, uh, documentations around are all for CPUs. But um, I would say that machine learning uh, provided uh, a big speed up in this uh, uh, for, for the usage of uh, hardware accelerating uh, acceleration platforms and um, providing some documentation. As you can see, I, I want to show you some uh, some code uh, with PDF flow. The here here you have uh, LHA PDF six. Uh, so the, the usual chart uh, uh, presented uh, before, as you can see, you just have uh, four lines uh, of code, four or five lines of code. You, you, have, to, um, you have to declare a PDF and then query all the uh, points in, with a for loop. With the PDF flow, that's the same. You, you declare a PDF and then uh, you use it uh, with your interface. But right. in order to create the interface, you have to uh, just uh, code as usual because uh, the TensorFlow uh, library allow you to do that. You have to code uh, as usual uh, with uh, your eager code and then wrap everything uh, with the TF function and then the, the, the trick is, uh, is done. So the, I would like to say that uh, there's no such uh, a pain in uh, this port to GPUs with this uh, te TensorFlow, but, but maybe with other uh, right. machine learning uh, libraries. That, that's great because uh, you have to pay attention on maybe uh, little things, uh, little things that uh, runs uh, um, in the good way, in the good way on TensorFlow, but uh, not uh, other implementation stuff. You don't have to, um, you don't have to learn uh, other uh, um, programming languages. To I see you, you kind of outsource the problem <laughs> to TensorFlow. I, I guess what we're all hoping is that Google yeah. will do the hard work for us of porting to AMD <laughs> and Intel. It worked with search engine, so why not with more? <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much again, Marco, and interesting little discussion. You are. Words, but we better nice move on now. Thank you um, very much. Um, just while Remy is setting up for the next talk, uh, let me just remind people that we also have Mattermost. I'll post the link again uh, for people so we can continue discussion there. Uh, but let's move on. So Remy will talk to us about um, the ILD software tools and detector performance. So go ahead, Remy. Yeah, sorry, it's on. Hi. Uh, yes, it's fine. You can see my slides. Yes, all good from our side. Okay, thanks. So, uh, hi everyone. I'm happy to give this talk today on behalf of uh, my collaboration, ILD. Uh, my name is Remy. I'm working for the Linear Collider community, and today we present this uh, software tools we have and uh, detector performance we get with uh, with these tools. So about the software, I'm actually talking about ILT Soft. So this is our software stack for the linear collider studies. Um, so it's been developed now since 20 years almost. Um, this is the software stack for ILC, but not only. It's used by other experiments. Uh, namely, it's actually uh, maintained by us uh, at FLC, uh, at, at DAISY, with the FLC group, but also at CERN with the CLIP group. So on the right, you have this uh, the, the picture, basically showing all the, the components we have inside. So generator to simulation, reconstruction, and analysis. And today I will cover simulation reconstruction uh, within our framework. So the main components there, the core components are, uh, that I will present a little bit later. Uh, we have DD4HEP, um, very nice uh, package on uh, geometry description for simulation and reconstruction for us. Um, LCIO package, which is our event data model and, and uh, format, uh, even, event format, 
And then we have Marlin, which is uh, designed for the reconstruction uh, based on LCIO. So um, starting with the D4HEP, that's uh, the detector geometry package. You have the GitHub link there. Uh, it's a generic detector description uh, for HEP. So it, it's a project that was started in the context of AIDA 2020 um, and mainly steered by the linear community at the beginning. And then different experiments started to use it. And now it's, it's developed by uh, mainly by LHGP people, if I'm, uh, if I'm correct and still a bit in the context of AIDA and will continue in the, in the next uh, AIDA thingy. Um, so it's used by plenty of experiments and more and more actually uh, experiments uh, are using it and also developing uh, on top of it and uh, collaborating with us. So it's very one of the, or um, what I've seen, one of the most beautiful, I think, collaborating software example I've, I've actually seen there. Um, so the, in terms of software itself, um, is a, basically a single complete description of your detector, including uh, for, uh, and all of this for simulation, the construction, analysis, visualizations. So you have the sketch on the right, as you can see. Um, basically, it's the concept of having one single source of geometry description for everything, and different interfaces on top for uh, depending if you want to run simulation, construction, and so on. So uh, you have this TDG4 package, which is built on top of uh, GN4 for the simulation. And what we use also here for the linear collider studies is DDREC, which gives basically a high level view on the, on the detector, namely to access the number of layers, extents, uh, materials of, of, the, of the detector itself. So, but the ILD detector, it's the one of the detector uh, on the, the forcing collision point of ILC. So um, there's an archive link there, which is um, which it links to what we call the IDR, the Interim Design Report of the ID Detector. Um, so basically, it describes what I'm talking about here. Um, this this implementation of the detector in our framework is very very realistic. So we describe all materials, extents, services, gaps, cooling pipe, very very um, really everything inside. So for, for this, um, this paper there, this, uh, this report, we have actually studied different designs and namely two designs um, based on a large and a small TPC uh, radius and everything in the strings. This is what you can see on the top level plot there. Um, and in there, uh, we are not decided yet with uh, the, the calorimeter options. So what we've, we've done actually, it's, it's quite unique, I think, in, in HEP. Uh, we have implemented uh, in the simulation the four different calorimeter option at the same time. So this is what you can see on the bottom right. This is an example with the HCAL. Uh, there we have the, the usual absorber in blue. Uh, and then instead of having all the PCBs, glues, and so on, and the sensitive detector, uh, we have the sensitive detector of one HCAL, but then we replaced everything else by another sensitive detector. So basically what we do is that we simulate the two HCAL at the same time. And this, we've done this for the HCAL and for the ECAL. And the table there is basically the different combinations uh, on the left, the different combinations of the ECAL and HCAL you can have, leading to four options. So why do we do that? It's because then you can simulate one detector, full detector with four options uh, within the same simulation. You save a lot of CPU by doing that and you minimize also the storage. Then if you want to reconstruct something, you have to choose an option and, and just go with it. If you want to see a bit more about the, the ILD concept, there's a very nice talk that actually happened a few minutes ago in another session uh, by Tomoiko on the ILD detector. So I just, it's a, it's a link, you can click on it. So about our event data model, uh, it's called LCIO for linear collider uh, IO. Uh, it's the data handling for all, uh, all the HEP workflow we have. So from Monte Carlo to, uh, to, to data and the construction analysis and so on. So it's very robust. It was developed almost 20 years ago and we still use it uh, almost kind of the same version as, as 20 years ago. It's very robust. Uh, it's a very, it's a standalone library. So uh, it's not based on root, it's really standalone. We use binary format, XDR and ZDIP compression. We have versioning of data inside. So uh, very backward compatible format and uh, very recently I've made it actually thread safe um, for multi-threading um, uh, development. 
So one of the nice things uh, we actually have in this in this framework it's what we call Etsy relation. This is what you see on the right with the different uh, the different objects we have inside. And this Etsy relation there it's it's basically a link between all different objects uh, type we have in, in our data model. And it's very convenient in particular to link objects from Monte Carlo to reconstruct it because then you can study uh, you can basically cheat algorithms sometime and and go back from. Uh, recall to MC very easily and compare quantities there. It's very nice what, what we uh, implemented there. Um, that's here content file is actually uh, quite independent. It's, it's user defined. Uh, usually what we use is uh, the format for a simulation for construction and then the schemed version of it. Uh, in the context of the, the stone mass, also in US, we are actually working on the mini DST format for, for high level analysis, in particular for theorists. Uh, for the, the reconstruction framework, we use Marlin. It's a very standard HEP even processing framework. It's based on LCIO, which has a strong focus on, on reconstruction analysis. So this is what you can see on the right, the working principle. So we describe the task list, basically a task being what we call the processor there. And um, yeah, it's the little boxes, digitization, tracking, and so on. So, uh, and then we just read events from the file and process them um, uh, in another way and uh, populate uh, the event with new data step by step. So very recently, uh, there was there was an effort to actually re-implement this framework um, towards a multi-threading usage also. It's called Marlin MT. It has been present in the chat actually a year ago. Um, I'll talk now about the production system because we've produced actually a lot of data recently. Uh, it's based on the, the DRAC grid system, uh, which is basically a job management system, uh, provide also a file catalog for us. Um, for in terms of the production system, uh, this transformation system, which allows you to, to transform your data from, from simulation to construction and so on. So this is all in Python. And on top of that, uh, we have a specific tools, which is, which is called IC DRAC, which is the extension for the IC and the CALIS uh, VOs. And you will find there some specific application for IC soft. Uh, it's operated and actually uh, developed uh, at CERN by the Click uh, Group. So we have a strong collaboration with them. And recently, we have actually produced uh, a lot of data for the for the ILD detector, um, namely at, at 500 GB center of mass and uh, with the expected luminosity of 500 uh, femtobarn, and produce almost one petabyte of data. So that's quite a lot. On the right, I've just put a plot there for information, basically showing that our simulation is basically taking twice CPU as, as our construction. Yeah. So I go now to the, the our reconstruction chain um, of, of for, for the ID. You can find the configuration there on the GitHub uh, the GitHub link there. It's clickable. Um, so basically, what we do, we have this background overlay, digitization, tracking, particle flow, high level recall. Uh, for the background overlay, this is mainly designed for really collision event, not single particle studies. So what we do is that we have different sources of backgrounds, namely uh, gamma, gamma to low PT advanced and plus and minus pairs uh, going to mainly in our forward detector, not only uh, maybe for the plus and minus pairs. And we overlay uh, one bunch crossing of data uh, on top of, of the physics event on the collision. So namely, uh, we have something like one background event per collision, depending on the, in total with all the different backgrounds. So this is what we overlay on top of our data before the digitization, which uh, actually does the DNA calibration for every detector, uh, the time integration for the electronics, and sometimes also depending on the detectors and the, the, the implementation of the, of the digitizers, we also emulate some inefficiency and noise randomization. So it's very complete also here. For the tracking, we do this in three steps. So uh, three independent steps. We have first in the vertex detector, uh, we run the cellular automaton to find some, some candidate tracks. Uh, in the forward detector, we do some triplet search of, of seeds, and then we extrapolate uh, with a kind of linear fit. Find some track candidates there also. And for the TPC, we look uh, outside in the outer pads, do some clustering there, and then start there for the, the, the Kalman filter, see the, the first one, and then go backward. This is what you can see on the left, just illustration. 
Um, then we get, we get basically three different set of tracks and then combine them and we run a Kalman filter refit on top of that to have our final tracks. Then comes the next step, which is the particle flow, something which is uh, really designed for uh, uh, our detectors there. So it's, it's uh, implemented by Pandora PFA and basically we reconstruct a uh, particle individually, uh, contrary to the, the standard approach in head physics. Um, there we do some calorimeter clustering first and then some pattern recognition association uh, uh, because you have some energy deposit a bit there and there and you want to associate correctly things. Uh, then you get basically a full picture of, of your events but then there can be some mistakes so we have some iterative reclustering recovery this is what you can see there on this picture you can have a neutral hadron for example in the vicinity of, of a charged hadron there so we just trigger um, a new algorithm locally uh, and recluster the thing to, to get a proper uh, track to cluster matching. When everything is done, we have some, some uh, very straightforward uh, particle identification, um, which provides this kind of this type there of, of particle IDs. Uh, on top of that, we have a more complete particle ID, which is based on, on, the, on the TPC DDX. Um, also, the shower shape uh, is computed a little bit later after the particle flow, and everything is combined in a multivariate analysis. Um, we also run some, some gamma gamma finders, so basically we identify some uh, different gammas and then do a kinematic fit to identify mainly pi zeros and eta uh, particles. We have also a primary primary vertex finder, uh, which is implemented in the CFI plus and the CFI vertex packages. Um, and then we have some, also some estimate of time of light using calorimeter heats, uh, using fast timing calorimeters. So. Uh, three minutes, Remy. Yeah, okay. Uh, for the ILT detector performance, um, uh, we have, uh, first I will talk about the tracking. Um, so this, the goal for the central tracks uh, in the barrel uh, for the momentum is, is like two to the minus five. This is what you can see on the left here, it's the red line. And namely we really uh, reach it um, correctly there. So we have very nice, nice performance there. For the tracking efficiency, as you can see there as a function of the momentum, uh, we are basically at one all the time and there's a little drop of efficiency, of course, if you do at very low momentum curves. Uh, tracks are very curling there and it's, it's a bit complicated to, to reconstruct things correctly at some point. Um, for the jet energy, um, this is the, the second thing we usually look at for the data performance. We use specific samples, which are what we call Z at rest, basically Z without um, any uh, kinematic energy, just, just decaying there with UDS uh, jets back to back. And what we do is that we compute the total energy and divide it by two is basically what we estimate as the jet energy for, for the data top performance. There, the goal is set up to have something like around three to 4%. And this is what you can see there on the left. We really uh, reach this, this uh, this performance there. Of course, if you go in, in some specific region of the detector, namely in the forward direction there, this is what you can see here. Uh, this is really degrading, of course, you have the beam pipe and, and a lot of gaps between uh, different detectors. So we are a little bit worse there, but in the barrel region, mainly this is what you have here. Uh, we are really reaching this performance. Uh, I go now to particle ID. Uh, Namely, what we have here is, is a TPC, so we use the DDX. And recently, what we've done in the context of this, uh, this document I talked about, we included, included also some time of flight estimate using the, the ECAL heats and fast timing uh, response of the detector. Uh, we have here the separation power, which is plotted on the right here. And what you can see um, is basically, if you, if you pick up the, 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 the yellow line there and uh, is these two ones there and the red here. It's basically the combination with and without uh, the, the time of flight estimate. And you can see at very low momentum uh, where normally the, the efficiency drops, the separation power drops there with the DDX only, you can nicely recover things to the top. So this is something we want to, to study more in the future. For the flavor tag, it's very crucial for some analysis, namely kicks to, to CC bar and BB bar. This is what you have on the, on the left here. Uh, BB bar on the left and CC bar on the right, and we use BDTs there and 
as you can see, we have very nice uh, uh, likeliness for, for Bs and Cs, uh, depending on what you study there. So very nice efficiency. Um, I come to my conclusion. So we have developed since uh, many years uh, the IC soft software stack um, for future collider studies, namely for, for the IC for us. We use the IC Dirac uh, Monte Carlo production system. And recently we have produced one petabyte of data for Monte Carlo studies. We have very excellent uh, IE performance, as I've shown also. And for the outlook, I would say that um, we are putting quite some effort also to make our software stack evolving towards a multi-threading usage. So it was actually my personal work also on this. Um, part of the tools we, that I've presented, namely SEIO, for example, is actually used as a basis for this project you might have heard about, this key for app which is the maybe the future frameworks for, for future experiments. And there's a lot of software that we actually share there and, uh, and we are very proud of it. For the reconstruction performance, there's of course still a lot of improvement to do. Uh, namely, we have very nice detectors, but we not, don't yet fully exploit the, all the features of our detectors in the reconstruction. And namely, we want to investigate a little bit more on the, on the fast timing side of, of, of the detectors. And there we can really improve things. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Remy. Uh, so we've probably got time for one quick question. If somebody has one. Yeah, can I ask a, a, a quick question, uh, Graham? Go ahead, Chief Jackson. Yeah. So Remy, you, you mentioned, thanks for your nice talk. I mean, you mentioned that this uh, evolution towards multi-threading, uh, are you considering also offloading to accelerators or something like that? Do you have any plans or? Uh, well, this could be could be good for reconstructing or tracking or something like that. For particle flow, I, 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 I think that as there are some iterations, this is not very well suited, but anyway, I mean, do you plan for, for that? So, um, so we are really early in our software and basically we looked around what, what people did actually. And uh, so it's very nice because we are a little bit late and we can actually watch what people are actually doing. And it's very nice to learn things quickly. Um, so what we've started to do uh, is first to have some parallel event processing. So that was our first step, namely to learn about all of this. Um, not sure we have, uh, except that, yet another plan for acceleration. Um, so mainly we are focusing on, on parallel event processing yeah. on the framework side. And of course, that's also the beauty of uh, the software the, there because we are using collaborative software and everyone has its own solution for, for acceleration. So we can also take benefits of it. But for the IC soft itself, it's mainly focused on parallel event processing. Primarily. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Remy, and, and I do like the fact that you've used so many packages which are used widely across HEP. I think that's a real strong point of the ILD community. However, time escapes us, so we'd better move on to um, Tom, who is going to give us the next talk on uh, spherical proportional counters. So take it away, Tom. Okay. Uh... I'll get started and I'll assume that you can see my slides and you can uh, hear me okay. Um, please stop me if you can't. Uh, so yeah, a slight change now. I'm going to talk about a uh, simulation framework for spherical proportional counters. Uh, this is work we've been doing at the University of Birmingham, uh, the people here. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, what are spherical proportional counters? So spherical proportional counters, which I'll refer to as SPCs throughout this talk, uh, and novel gaseous detectors with multiple potential applications. Uh, these include uh, searching for dark matter, neutron spectroscopy, uh, neutrino of stable beta decay, and other low energy neutrino physics. So there's a wide range of uses for these uh, detectors and being able to simulate what happens in them is crucial for future detector design and for interpreting measured data. Um, to put a picture in your mind what these detectors look like. So these aren't cathedral sized detectors like uh, we see at the LHC. These tend to be much, much smaller, uh, but they're these metallic spheres. Um, so you can see this, this one in the top left might be familiar to some of you. This is a former LEP RF cavity 
uh, which is repurposed. This was the, the prototype SPC. And then we see several SPCs from around the world. The bottom two, we are, are owned by us at the University of, of Birmingham. The one on the right actually sits in, in one of the buildings at the university. Unfortunately, we've not been able to access it the past few months. And this one, this photo on the bottom left was taken at Bullby Underground uh, Laboratory, which is in, in Yorkshire in the UK, um, where we've set up a, a, a small R&D project with, with an SPC. So a, a quick overview about uh, what these are. So you have a grounded metallic shell, as you saw on the previous slide. And inside this sphere, you, you fill it with uh, gas. And then you have a, a central anode sensor. So you try and put an anode directly at the center of the sphere. Uh, you see in this diagram here, this is what the anode looks like. Of course, you have to support that by, by some rod. And this rod contains a high voltage wire, which uh, creates a, a, a radial electric field inside the sphere. There's uh, several advantages to this, this spherical shape. Um, you have uh, low capacitance, which is largely independent of the size of your detector. You can operate it at high pressure, and you have the optimal volume to surface ratio. Additionally, uh, one nice thing about these SPCs is that it's very easy to swap the, uh, the gas inside um, to suit your physics needs. Uh, so there's a, a variety of gases which are good for, for certain things, and I'll, I'll touch on that a bit later. So SPCs are essentially spherical uh, time projection chambers. Uh, this is just how they work. So you have some ionizing particle which will enter into your gas, uh, and that produces uh, initial ionization electrons. These can, of course, uh, further ionize the gas, producing more electrons. And then, as I said uh, previously, we have this uh, electric field, um, which causes the electrons to drift towards the center of the detector. Once they get um, very close to the anode, uh, the electric field is strong enough to cause them to avalanche, and they produce many electron ion pairs. Uh, these continue to drift, and the uh, drift of these ions away from the anode and the electrons towards the anode um, induces a, a signal that we can read out, uh, process, and, and store. Um, so now onto our, our simulation framework. So what we've done is we've combined uh, other pieces of software into a complete simulation of SPCs. Uh, so there's three main components that are used. Uh, we use uh, JL4 for simulating the interactions of, of particles and radiation with matter. Uh, we use Garfield++, which is a package developed primarily for micropattern gas detectors. Um, but we use this for simulating the electron ion drift um, and for calculating our signal. So Garfield is, is a nice package which interfaces to, to several other things, uh, such as HEAD, SRUM, and MagVolts. Uh, so HEAD is for uh, primary ionization, uh, for delta electron calculations. SRUM is for the... Uh, uh, energy deposition of ions and matter and magvolts is, is a gas properties program. And then we use a program called ANSYS, which is a finite element solver for um, electric field calculations. You can see an example of an electric field produced by ANSYS here. Um, so this is a slice in the detector and you see the features I showed on the previous slide. You see the supporting rod, uh, the central anode where the electric field magnitude is strong. And then towards the edge of the detector, it becomes weak. So our framework combines these toolkits along with some custom calculations to, to produce the, the full simulation of the detector. Um, so I'll just step through each, each, each part of the simulation now. Uh, so the first thing we do is the initial uh, particle tracking. So this is, is done with JAMP4. Uh, so we can use the, uh, the very useful uh, particle gun uh, class of GM4 to produce our initial ionizing particles. This, of course, gives us uh, complete flexibility about what we want to study. So we can choose what particle we want to study, what energy it has, where it starts, what direction, and so on. Um, and this is really useful for, for mimicking calibration sources. So when you're calibrating an SPC, you typically put a radioactive source in. Uh, so if we had an alpha particle source, for example, we could we could place our, our, our particle gun where we put our source and, and fire off particles of, of a specific energy. 
One thing that we've added uh, quite recently is the ability to use Geant Pro's radioactive decay physics model. Um, this is really nice because it allows us to just put unstable isotopes in our detector and let Geant Pro de deal with the details of, of how those isotopes decay. So in this plot on the right, you see um, an example of at 1000 argon 37 decays. Uh, argon 37 is, is a typical calibration source. And you see that Geant Pro deals with how many events decay via um, K-shell, electron capture, L-shell, and M-shell, and whether uh, they give you Auger electrons or, or X-rays. So rather than having to simulate these three peaks separately and normalize the appropriate, uh, normalize the contributions, you can just rely on the model to, to the point you trust it, of course. After you've um, produced your initial particle, we continue to track it with JL4 until it produces electrons um, with energy of less than 2 keV. At that point, uh, we switch over to uh, using Garfield++. So JL4 passes the information about where these electrons are to Garfield++, and that takes over. So the first thing is that Garfield uses He to produce delta electrons. Um, another relatively new feature we added was the ability to use SRIM. So this is, a, as I briefly mentioned, this allows us to study the DE, DX of, of ions and matter. So uh, we've added the support for alpha particles uh, for SRIM. Uh, you see a plot on the right here of the number of initial electrons produced uh, by a 5.3 MeV alpha particle, just to give you an idea of, of, of how many particles we're producing here. So this is a, a single alpha particle, uh, well, many, many events, um, but just one, one alpha particle per event, and you get something like 204,000 initial electrons uh, produced in your gas. Once you have these, these ionization electrons, what you want to do is you want to uh, drift them towards the avalanche region. Uh, so that's the next step. Uh, so this is done using a combination of uh, ANSYS, which gives us our electric field map, and MagBolts, which gives us the properties of the gas we're using um, via the Garfield++ interfaces. Um, so you see here some plots produced from MagBolts uh, showing a few properties of, of the gas, of a particular gas. So this is argon CH4, uh, two different pressures. And you can see how various properties change as you increase the electric field strength. So as you increase the electric field strength, the drift velocity tends to increase, um, but the diffusion uh, tends to decrease. So these are the transverse and, and longitudinal components, uh, diffusion coefficients. So as, as the electric field strength gets stronger, diffusion there decreases. So this, big, this diffusion is very important in the, in the outer regions of, of the detector where the electric field strength is, is lower. Once we reach the, the central region of the detector, that's when the, the avalanche starts. Um, so this is where the electrons produce many um, electron ion pairs. Uh, depending on exactly the properties of the detector, this process can, can uh, produce several uh, tens of thousands or, or even hundreds of thousands of electron ion pairs. And if we were to track each individual um, electron ion pair that was produced, this would become extremely computationally expensive. So for a single event, we'd have to, have to uh, track um, perhaps millions of individual electrons. Um, so we don't do that. We, we use a, a, a bit of a trick. What we do, we parameterize the gain by uh, numerically integrating the Townsend coefficient, which is shown in this top plot, minus the attachment coefficient, which is this bottom plot, along the path of, of each uh, primary electron. So we still have to do this for, say, 200,000 electrons, like I showed a, a, a few slides ago, but we don't have to do it for 200 uh, or 2 million electrons. So this, uh, this is a, a time-saving trick. And once you've got this integral, uh, you can use it to, uh, you take the exponential to get that average gain, and that tells you um, how many electron ion pairs were produced. Um, and and this, this follows a, a polyer distribution, so you just need to calculate the average, tra average gain, draw a random number, and, and then you found out how many uh, electron ion pairs you have. Uh, your, your output from your simulation is, is a voltage pulse. Uh, so this is shown by this pinkish line here. 
Uh, this is a, a typical pulse that you would see in, in your in your experiment. Um, often in in the experiment, they deconvolve that to a to a current pulse, which is shown by this purple uh, negative pulse. In the simulation, of course, we have direct access to both of these. Um, what you would typically do in an analysis is look at uh, some properties of each of these pulses uh, and reduce them down to, to single uh, single numbers. So typical things that I'll show include uh, the integral of the pulse or the uh, maximum amplitude of the pulse, uh, which is useful for particle ID, um, but also the rise time of the pulse, which we define as the time it takes to go from 10% of the pulse uh, maximum amplitude to 90% of the pulse maximum amplitude. Um, so this allows us to distinguish different types of events in our detector. And I've demonstrated that in, in the first real use case here on slide 12, um, which is neutron spectroscopy. Um, so SPCs can be used as neutron spectrometers if you fill them with, with uh, nitrogen gas. Uh, if you do that, you have two main processes that occur. So you have a, a neutron interacts with a, a nitrogen uh, nucleus to give you carbon, uh, carbon and a proton, or neutron interacts with nitrogen to give you boron and an alpha particle. And it's these proton and alpha particles uh, which, which interact with the gas in our detector and, uh, and, and produce uh, tracks. So you can use, if, if you see at the bottom here, this is kind of a, a walkthrough of what's happening. So on the left plot here, we have uh, many events overlaid. So each event typically just has a, a single track in. Um, here we have a neutron beam coming in from the right, uh, traveling along this orange line. And these teal colored lines are the tracks left by alpha particles, which tend to be very short. And the pink lines are uh, tracks left by protons, which tend to be much longer. So if you were able to distinguish long tracks from short tracks, uh, you'd be able to distinguish whether a, uh, the proton interaction or the alpha interaction had occurred. Three minutes. Um, yeah, okay, great. Okay, and uh, you can do that by looking at the uh, properties of the pulse. Um, so you see that these short alpha tracks, all their energy is deposited in the detector. You get very large pulses. Protons, you tend to get smaller pulses. And then if you take some of these individual properties of each of these lines uh, to say, look at the pulse integral on the x-axis and the rise time on the y-axis, you see that you really nicely separate out these different types of events. So you, Alpha events have a, a large integral and low rise time. Proton events have a low integral and, and high rise time. And these elastic scattering events have a low integral and low rise time. So you can use that to, to determine what occurred. Uh, the second use case I'll talk about is the R2D2 experiment. So this is a, an R&D project uh, aiming to use an SPC to search for neutrino stable beta decay. Uh, so we recently worked with that collaboration uh, providing some simulation of their detector. So what they were doing was was calibrating or, or investigating the, I should say, the energy resolution of, of, of a detector. Uh, so they had a 40 centimeter diameter SPC filled with argon and methane, and they had an alpha particle source. And they put that alpha particle source in the detector and then looked at the energy resolution. Uh, you see this plot in the top right is a histogram, a 2D histogram of the data uh, so the x-axis here is actually the integral of the current, which they call QT, and DT is the duration of the, of the current pulse. Um, and you can see they get a peak of events uh, here at a single uh, integral value, and then they get this tail of events uh, coming down here. Uh, so we were able to simulate this, and you see our simulation uh, in the bottom right-hand plot here. Rather than a histogram now, we just have a scatter plot where the point represents the direction the alpha particle traveled. And you can see that as the direction of the alpha particle changes, its position on this, this plot changes. So these events in this peak region are where the entire alpha particle track is contained within the detector. And then at this tail, these are when the alpha particle tracks hit the wall of the detector and you lose some of their energy and don't record it. But you see the agreement here is, is quite nice. Uh, the final use case I'll talk about is um, something that's being investigated by the NEWS-G collaboration, which is uh, searching for dark matter. So they've been 
looking at a new type of anode sensor. So traditionally, as I showed at the start, SPCs have single anode sensors, uh, but recently progress has been made in using multiple anode sensors. So these are called Akinos sensors. Uh, Akinos is the Greek word for sea urchin, and you can see from this picture down here why, why they've chosen that name. What this essentially allows you is to, is to read down multiple channels uh, from, your, from your event. Um, so what we've done so far is look at simulating two readouts. So you read out the top uh, six anodes and the, and the bottom five anodes, and you get two pulses now to deal with. What you can do with that is construct an asymmetry to give you some directional information about whereabouts in your, in your, um, in your detector your interaction occurred. So I think I'm out of time now, so I'll just go to the summary. So we've developed a, a simulation framework for these SPCs and they allow us to study them in, in some detail. Um, SPCs are, are a very versatile detector, allowing us to search for many different types of uh, physics, so dark matter, neutrino stable beta decay, and neutron spectroscopy. Um, we're now starting to see comparisons of our simulation with data, and so far we see uh, good agreement uh, but we're continuing to work with a variety of different experiments uh, and provide simulation for them. So there's a few other talks I've, I've, that have already happened, so you can go and watch them on YouTube. Uh, I'll put the links here. So to the R2D2 results, neutron spectroscopy and USG. And I've also just put a link to our, our paper that we wrote about this here on the right. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Tom. That was very interesting. Uh, so we're kind of on time, but I think we can afford to take a question or two if people have them. Okay, if there's nothing from anybody else, I was going to ask um, actually about the field. I got the impression that you use ANSYS to solve the electric field equations inside the detector. Um, and I was wondering if actually during the event when you're counting particles and avalanches are going on, do you actually have to take into account the, the avalanche effects on the electric field? So at the moment we don't do that, but that is something that can uh, have an impact and that's something that uh, we will be investigating in the future. So you get an effect where that you've got a a lot of charge in a specific region of your detector, and that can that can distort the uh, the electric field in that region. Okay, um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, what's the sort of I would guess for a typical? It depends on the size, but for a typical one of these devices, what is the kind of time that it takes from uh, for the charge to drift, avalanche, and be detected? Yes, yeah, it's, it's of order uh, seconds uh, for the for the the full thing to, to happen. But yes, of course, it does depend on the size I have. So these aren't huge beasts, but they are growing. Um, so this is a, a little uh, sketch of, of the different sizes that the largest one currently in operation is, is Snow Globe, which is at Snow Lab in Canada. That's going to be used for searching for dark matter. Um, so that's 140 centimeters in diameter. And of course, the drift time in this detector is much larger than a, than a 30 centimeter sphere that we, that we just have for our idea at Birmingham. Super, thanks very much. I don't see anything else. So that's great. I think then we can go to our first break and we will resume at, well, 20 past nine if you're in European time, 20 past eight if you're in. UK time and uh, adjust for your time zone accordingly. So thanks to the three speakers in the first session uh, today and uh, let's say we'll resume in about 18 minutes. Uh, Davide, maybe you could set up your slides and we can be ready to go off sharply at 20 past. Yeah, sure. Can you see them, right? Yeah. Okay. Go full screen. Uh, just let me select the pointer. Okay. Okay, great. Can you also see my pointer, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's very useful. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, uh, well, welcome back from the break, everybody. Um, and uh, the next uh, section of the uh, session today, we turn towards machine learning. So first of all, we're going to hear from Davide about quantum inspired machine learning on high energy physics data. So I'll turn over to you, Davide, and let you begin. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm, um, good morning, everyone. I'm really glad to give this talk. I will show you some recent results uh, on, the, on the last work that we did, uh, which is titled Quantum Inspired Machine Learning on High Energy Physics Data. Uh, this work was done by the NHCB Padova Group uh, in collaboration with the Quantum Information Group uh, from the University of Padova. Uh, this is uh, the outline, so I will, be, I will briefly describe the physics case uh, that we studied and the tool that we used, which is uh, the Theory Tensor Network. Then I will describe the work and the results that we achieved, and then we'll draw some conclusions. So at CLSCP, we're interested in identifying jets, uh, which are produced by heavy framework quarks, namely B and C quarks. And the technique that we use is the so-called jet flavor tacking. Uh, in particular, uh, for our physics case, we have considered B jet flavor tacking. So uh, basically tag jets generated by B quarks. Uh, why uh, do we want to do that? Uh, uh, well, we would like to distinguish jets that are produced from B and anti-B quarks, and this is a fundamental technique because it enables us to measure uh, the BB bar charge symmetry, which is defined here, where uh, delta Y is the difference in pseudo rapidity. Uh, and also, uh, the, the symmetry is sensitive to new physics uh, processes, so uh, that's why it's so important to measure it with uh, a uh, really uh, great precision. Uh, in round one, the BJS flavor tagging has been performed with the muon tagging approach. So basically, you search for the highest trans momentum muon inside the jet, and the charge of the muon is related through a semi leptonic decay uh, to the charge of the, um, of the quark that has generated the jet. And here the, um, is the link to the result to the round one. Uh, this is also this has been doing also for the run two, um, but as you know, recently machine learning algorithms have been developed to solve high energy physics problems, um, and the paradigm here is different because uh, uh, the the whole jet substructure uh, is used as input. So you just select some variables of the jet substructure and you use them as input for your algorithm. So the situation is basically this one. So here is a sketch of an event at LHCB where I kind of highlight the two jets. And this is what has already been done. So you, have, you take your uh, neural network, you take your machine learning algorithm, uh, you select your input and you get some prediction, some output. And here actually what is what we have done in our, uh, in our work. So we are considering the so-called tensor networks. Why would you like to change this paradigm? Basically, because we would like to solve, let's say, some open problems on machine learning. Uh, one is to understand what the algorithm is doing. So, for example, we'd like to, con to consider and to measure the correlations between the features, uh, between the, uh, the input variables that we use uh, in the algorithm. And we would like also to perform some real-time applications. So, as you may know, uh, going to uh, the next round of LHC, we would need some prediction time of around nanoseconds. So this is, this is quite a challenge. So let me present what is a three tensor network, which is uh, the tool that we use in this work. So tensor networks actually are a mathematical tool uh, used to investigate quantum many body systems on classical computers. And this relies on an efficient representation of quantum wave function. And this is achieved actually by approximizing a uh, higher order tensor by a set of lower order tensors, which follows a typical uh, geometry. So this is the main idea. So here you have your whole tensor describing uh, your wave function, and you just go through a, a contraction of low order tensors, uh, as, as you can see here. And this is obtained basically by using some, um, let's say, typical operations with tensors. So you can contract, you can reshape, and you can factorize. Uh, you can factorize tensor. Um, 
not only uh, you can do this, but you can also uh, tune, you can also control the approximation uh, via the so-called bond dimension, chi. So here you see, for example, that the whole tensor has two to the n parameters, so it's a huge tensor. Uh, by uh, using this uh, uh, tensor network approximation, you see that the numbers of parameters change dramatically, and it is controlled by the bond dimension. Basically, the bond dimension is the uh, dimension of the contracted indices between uh, the tensors. And the greater the bond dimension, of course, the better the approximation, but of course also, uh, let's say, um, the huge is, will be the computational time, as we will see, to, uh, to compute this tensor. Uh, and as I said, uh, you can use several geometries. I would say that the most famous one is the matrix product state here, which resembles uh, uh, one chain of uh, spins, but there are several actually. Here in our work, we have used uh, the so-called tree tensor network. As you can see, it has this kind of tree, uh, of tree shape. Tree tensor networks are useful to uh, do some uh, supervised machine learning problems. And as you know, a typical machine learning problem starts from a data samples, uh, X, which are encoded in a dimensional future space uh, via a feature map. Uh, then you also have your weight tensor, and uh, this contraction describes your decision function. Uh, here, we select this kind of uh, uh, future map, which is actually a product of n local feature maps. And each of these feature maps is described in the following way. So uh, basically, each feature, x of i, is represented, I would say, by a quantum spin. So here is, the, let's say, the quantum inspiration. Uh, OK. And the output of, the, uh, of your algorithm is actually a probability uh, for uh, that kind of sample to be, to, to be of one class of another. So here's the probability. Uh, so this is the flow. So you have your raw data, you have this mapping to spins. So here's the quantum inspired uh, thing. Then you go to your tensor network, which has been trained and evaluated, and then you have your prediction. So here's the flow that will follow. So let me describe our work and our results. So we started from some Monte Carlo samples uh, from ADCB open data. Uh, we used uh, uh, BB bar digest events at, at 13 TV, uh, so basically around two conditions. And we apply some kinematic cuts on the trans momentum, on the pseudo rapidity, and we require both jets to contain uh, a secondary vertex, the so called SV tagging. Uh, inside each jet, uh, we select uh, uh, these particles, so muons, electrons, pions, kaons, and protons, and we select the ones with the highest trans momentum. And for each of this particle, we select three variables, the charge, Q, the uh, transfer momentum relative to the jet axis, and the distance between the particle and the jet axis in the eta uh, phi uh, space. Okay. Uh, as a final uh, variable, we select the, the jet charge defined in the following way. So we are selecting 16 variables for, uh, for each jet to describe the jet substructure. So we are, we are using a so-called inclusive jet tagging algorithm. In the, in the picture here, you can see the difference from uh, the standard tagging algorithm, which relies on one single particle and the inclusive tagging that we have used uh, here. Then uh, we used a tensor network and a deep neural network as classifiers. As I said, the output of these classifiers is a probability, uh, which is defined actually in the following way. If the probability is greater than 0.5, the jet is classified to be generated by a big work and vice versa for an anti big work. Um, our figure of merit, so what we would like to, uh, let's say, maximize, what we would like to see, to study, is the uh, so called tagging power epsilon tag, uh, which actually says how many jets are tagged correctly. So you see uh, it's obtained by, uh, by a product of efficiency, so how many, fraction, how many jets are actually classified, uh, times this factor which relies on the um, accuracy, which is the fraction of jets that are correctly classified. Um, the performances of these two classifiers are compared with each other and are compared with the standard neural tagging approach. And of course, since we would like to maximize the tagging uh, power, uh, we apply some cuts on the distribution probability in order to maximize it. 
So here are some results. On the left, you see the tagging power as a function of the jet transfer momentum. Uh, so you see that both, uh, both algorithms, both uh, uh, the DNN and the tensor network outperform the standard mean tagging by a factor of 10. Uh, we, we obtain better performances uh, at lower uh, jet transfer momentum. But the really interesting thing is that both uh, the tensor network and the deep neural network have similar performances, as you can see here. Um, Moreover, you can see that the output of the two classifiers are greatly correlated, as you can see in the plot of the right. So here I'm plotting the probability for the DNN and the TTN for B and DBAR quarks, and you see that there is a, a great correlation. And we also perform some tests on physical variables, so the distribution of transfer momentum and the eta, in order to check for biases, and we haven't found them. So this is, this is great. Going further, actually, we see that the distribution probabilities are rather different. So here is the distribution probability for the tensor network and from the uh, deep neural network. We see that they are, despite the similar performances, the two distribution probabilities are totally different. So here you can also see the cuts that we have applied in order to maximize uh, the attacking power. And the interesting thing here is that the tensor network is actually able to spot the presence of mu inside the jet. So here, these peaks at zero and one uh, actually uh, say that uh, we, are, we have a great confidence in uh, tagging a jet to be generated by an NTB or a B core. Okay. And uh, since these two uh, plots here in the bottom, the, the black ones, are the one where a muon is found inside the jet, we can see that the tensor network actually can, can spot the presence of a mu, while actually the, tensor, the deep neural network doesn't have this confidence, these uh, confidence predictions. We went further because uh, we would like also to measure correlation. So we would like to understand uh, the relations between the features, between the input that we use. And here, since the tensor network relies on this uh, uh, quantum approach, um, we can measure correlation and entanglement and entropy. So for example, if two uh, features are highly correlated, is it possible to uh, neglect at least one of them? And if the entropy of the set of features is low, then all the features coming from that set can be discarded, okay? Uh, this algorithm that performs this kind of selections is called uh, quantum information post-training feature selection. And in this way, from the 16 variables of the jet, we select just the eight most important variables. Not only this, but as I said, also time, also the prediction times plays an important role. And then here, the key point is that uh, we can, uh, let's say, have better prediction time, have better performances in timing by, uh, by uh, truncating the tensor network uh, without retraining it. So this algorithm, which is called the quantum information adaptive network optimization, allows you to train the tensor network to a maximum bond dimension that you choose, okay? After the training, you can truncate the tensor network by simply lower the bond dimension. As I said, the, low, the bond dimension is uh, the dimension that uh, controls, let's say, the approximation uh, of, the, of the general tensor. And we will see that actually the critical amount of information is kept. But the truncating tensor network can classify your data in a lower computational time, as you can see in the graph here. You see that there is a, a direct proportionality between uh, the bond dimension chi and uh, the uh, prediction time. So uh, we applied both the QX algorithm and the Quiano algorithm, and we obtained uh, some significant results. Uh, so, first of all, on the left, you see that by just applying the QX algorithm, so just by selecting the best eight, uh, best eight features, uh, we see that we lose only 1% of accuracy. Okay, so this algorithm, as I said, uh, allows you to select the most relevant features uh, for, the, uh, for the prediction. So we don't lose too much accuracy here. Uh, while, when applying also the Quiano algorithms, for both the complete model, so the one with 16 features, and for the best eight, so the one with the eight features, we can lower the prediction time from 345 microseconds to 37 microseconds, so almost a factor of 10. 
And if we apply both the two algorithms, so we select the best state features and then we truncate the bond dimension in order to lower the prediction time, we can also reach uh, 19 microseconds of uh, prediction time while still maintaining, as you can see here, compatible accuracy with the complete model. This was done also, uh, which was done only using uh, uh, one, uh, one core of CPU. So planning to parallelize this on GPUs, uh, we are pretty much confident that we obtain a speed up of a factor around 10 to 100. So that's, that's really interesting. Okay, so let me come to the conclusion. So um, we know that new machine learning algorithms are actually required to analyze LHC data, particularly in uh, future ranks where we would have challenging, challenging, uh, let's say, a challenging environment. And we have just proved that tensor, three tensor networks are actually a suited method to do some, to solve some supervised machine learning problems such as the jet flavor tagging. Uh, we have comparable performances with respect to the uh, deep neural network. And of course, we are outperforming the standard jet tagging algorithm, but we can measure correlation and entropy between the input variables in order to select the most relevant features. And we can also lower the prediction time by just truncating the tensor network after uh, the training. So for the future, we would like to start to study uh, more complex tasks. For, so for example, uh, tagging B, uh, tagging jets generated by B and C uh, works. Uh, that's really interesting. And uh, we would also like to, uh, to perform some real time uh, applications. So that's all from my side. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, super, thanks very much, Davide. So um, let me open to questions. You can just raise your hand and zoom. Well, let me jump in and ask uh, one. You said that one of the nice things about this method was that uh, you can make the prediction comprehensible somehow you can get more insight into what uh, the network is doing. Now, I see that you use the network to identify which are the important variables, but do you get some insight into the way that the network processes and correlates the variables with this method as opposed to the DNN? Yeah, actually we had some insights uh, about this. So let me just go through. Okay, I have this one. So here, for example, uh, you can see what happens actually uh, by selecting just a, a few uh, few uh, features from some variables. So you see, for example, here that uh, um, the muon and the kon plays an important role uh, in the tagging power. Okay. Um, so this comes basically from from the physics and. Uh, if we go back to the uh, this one, to this graph here, here I'm showing uh, the, the correlation between the features. Actually, the features are ordered from uh, from one to sixteen, uh, um, and the entropy here. So here, if I remember well, are the uh, the features from the kon and the minimum. So what I get here from the tensor network is that the kon and the muon features are really important in defining, in, in classifying jets. So basically I'm, I'm getting some insights on the physics that's, uh, that's, going, uh, that's going under this, uh, uh, this, uh, this event, yeah. Okay, and if I understand correctly, it's really the way that you can sort of truncate this method much more easily than taking a DNN, removing a variable, retraining the entire thing. It's, much faster to do. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, let's say the, the most interesting aspect, the fact that you don't need to retrain uh, your, your network, but you can just truncate it. Actually, what we found is that, let's say that you want to, uh, you want to uh, train a network, a tensor network with bond dimension 10, okay, and then get uh, your prediction. Actually, what you get is that uh, if you train your network with a bond dimension 200, and then you truncate it to 10, 
you get better uh, prediction performances than just training directly to one dimension equal 10. Okay, so that, that's the interesting thing. You can train, uh, let's say, whatever you want, whatever you like, uh, and then you can truncate and still get accuracy, good accuracy, but lower prediction times, really lower. Yeah, okay, that's extremely interesting. Any last questions? I, I, I need to jump into that. So I think if, oh, it's yeah. hard, if you train it to 100 dimensions and then truncate it, I think what you give, at least in my head, what I understand is you allow the network to to actually have in this more more multi-dimensional space to get a better, let's say, eigen representation of of the internal uh, uh, correlations, right? And then you and then you cut out the best ones. Yeah. Then you try. Yeah. So so I think that's actually very clever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's actually yeah a very let's say powerful tool to use uh, because uh, I mean you can it's kind of a trade off because you, you can choose uh, let's say uh, uh, a too much uh, higher uh, bond dimension because otherwise uh, uh, you get of course a better approximation but it requires a lot of time to train but still if you if you let's say have a trade off in the training part then you can do some really good stuff on the prediction part so yeah, yeah. very clever hey. like that yeah. Thanks, Davide. So uh, we better move on. So Andy is actually the next speaker. So he's going to be telling us about uh, the Track ML challenge that people will know around. Uh, Here we go. Let's do this. I think we're all set up, right? Yep. Go, go. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll give the conclusion of the Track ML uh, challenge. Uh, I think it's going to be our rather last big conference talk. So I'm going to talk you through uh, the challenge and the main solutions and a, and a few findings which we, uh, which we uh, which we did with that. So I think that's actually uh, the the outline. Uh, so from the organization, we ran this challenge in two phases uh, on two different platforms, uh, all in uh, within 2018, uh, and uh, we had different focuses on the two challenges uh, or two parts of the challenge, which I will uh, tell you afterwards a bit more in detail. And we were composed as a good mix from uh, uh, LHC experiments and, uh, and uh, machine learning experts to set this up. Uh, and uh, we also have some summary publications uh, of, this, uh, of these two, two uh, challenges to come. Now, this would not have been possible without our sponsors. Uh, on slide three, you, see, uh, you will see that we gave the winners some prize money and we needed some infrastructure. Uh, and we were very grateful to have a, a set of sponsors actually helping us uh, in this. Now, the challenge uh, itself uh, uh, was concerned concerning particle tracking, and I'm not going to go into details. That's the CMS detector, but it's just the innermost uh, part of the tracker. And the aim was to find trajectories from, from particles digested in a way that non-community experts could participate. Uh, so that took uh, quite quite a long time in the, uh, in the making. Um, what was the motivation behind that? Uh, particle tracking per se is almost a, a simple thing. If you have a low multiplicity, you have it on the left side here. Uh, the hits from one particle in the magnetic field, which is constant, are even spotable by eye. If you inc increase the luminosity, and at the bottom you see the the interaction reaching basically from run, run one with around five pile up to the ultimate scenario, if it ever happened, FDFCCHH with around thousand, uh, it gets more and more complicated. Uh, and as it does, it scales also in time like this. Now, this is just a, uh, a, a, a illustration. It's a, it's a highly nonlinear uh, scaling in, in processing this with classic algorithms. And I leave it to you to look up at the experiments. Uh, they are different scaling plots, which are updated constantly uh, due to the fact that uh, the experiments are putting, as we also saw before, quite a lot of work in trying to optimize this. Now, for the challenge, we needed a detector. So we, we came up with a virtual uh, detector, the track ML detector. I'll walk you very quickly through a classical collision experiment detector for uh, pixel barrel layers. Uh, centrally with disks at the end, then enclosed by a short strip uh, system um, that defined the coverage to some uh, some eta coverage uh, to three. 
We did not expand to ETA4 as the phase two detectors will go because we wanted to compare to, let's say, our known best, uh, best uh, algorithms. And uh, then uh, followed or finalized by a long strip detector all in all such that we had some realistic but optimistic material budget. You see the thickness of the detector at the bottom. And in this virtual detector, we simulated uh, HLLHC type events uh, with a, a TTPAR uh, um, signal event overlaid with a 200, uh, average 200 pileup. You see the PT distribution. Uh, we used a, a fast track simulation of the ACTS package. Uh, all in all that, came to about 10,000 particles and 100,000 hits per event. So that's the ball uh, park numbers. Uh, we quasi realistically digitized this by using a geometric approach that you had non-Gaussian uh, hit residuals. You see some examples for the pixels there, just to make it, let's say, not a, a toy, toy example to solve. Uh, and this we prepared into a data set uh, in CSV format uh, in order to allow people from entirely outside the field to digest this. So uh, this is just some structure. You would have all the hits labeled. You will have details about the hits. Uh, if you look uh, on, on a pixelated module, for instance, you could, you could get the, the, the cluster shapes. You can even get the, the charge deposition inside the cluster. Uh, and uh, this is connected for the training data set uh, with a huge uh, truth uh, uh, file where you basically could, could uh, look up the uh, the uh, the uh, the ground truth where did this hit come from? That's what the hits look like. And then the challenge was to find uh, connected hits, so a labeled set of hits, uh, which would then uh, qualify as a, as a, as a one um, uh, as, as one track. And the idea was, can you find all these tracks? Uh, so a solution would be a labeled set of hits and we would uh, that would be submitted as again as a csv file to the platform uh, with the ground truth at the uh, for this uh, for the evaluation data set at the platform we'd apply some scoring uh, and then uh, that would uh, rank you in, in in the challenge the scoring was uh, taken a lot from what we're using at the uh, lhg experiments but modified and simplified so uh, we practically did uh, give a, a final score, which was the sum over all events, uh, the sum over all tracks, then a weight for the track. You can see the weight function at the bottom at the life, uh, left where we would like to just encourage to have high PT tracks to encourage a bit more the, the signal uh, event. And then uh, within the, the tracks, uh, this was basically composed as the hit uh, sum and the, uh, the, uh, the, the hit sum was done such that we favored mostly the innermost hits and the outermost for track completion and, uh, and uh, give, uh, give zero weight for unmatched uh, uh, hits. So the optimal score is one, you got everything right. Uh, and the teams would submit, we would evaluate and then we'll come with an online leaderboard and once the time is up, uh, you could get some, uh, you would get some su substantial uh, prize money, which you can see here, uh, which was kindly given to us by the sponsors. So that's, that's the outline. Now let's look into phase one. How did fa phase one go? This was performed, uh, let's say halfway through 2018 uh, with a hundred days open window to submit uh, your, your solutions. And uh, if you now look at the score evolution, this is the the, uh, the days from the start of the challenge versus, versus the best score of the 100 best teams, uh, you can actually see how this evolved. Uh, and you can see that immediately, so we gave a, a starting kit that gave uh, a, a score, of, a really low score of uh, about 20%. You can almost read that as 20% tracking efficiency. It's not entirely correct due to the weighting, uh, but you can see how uh, high of how fast the score developed and uh, at the end, we had uh, uh, roughly 700 or 650 teams uh, sub submitting uh, with the final score of 0 0.92, which uh, is a, an amazing score to, 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 to quote it. Now let's go through the final leaderboards. Uh, these are the first, this is the final leaderboard. The final leaderboard was done as a private leaderboard on events that have not, never been seen. 
uh, and also the leaderboard was never visible to the to the the private leaderboard was never visible to the contestants in order not to encourage submission submissions to to basically do statistical improvements on your on your score so we did, did a lot of uh, care on that let's go quickly through the through the the winning solution uh, number 1 phase 1 uh, a non hep uh, member um, who who made an algorithm that was a mixture between a classical uh, uh, pattern recognition algorithm with some pruning uh, and and uh, some some uh, um, track cleaning that was done with uh, scikit-learn um, with starting from pairs of hits and then basically extending that uh, and that uh, gave the winning solution with quite a substantial wall time if you see seven minutes per event but uh, at the first uh, phase we did not ask for for the speed of uh, of the algorithms that was followed up closely by um, uh, and another non hep mem member which was a pure ml approach that used uh, python and keras uh, that basically created a massive uh, uh, deep network with uh, with uh, you see 4000 input layers 2000 oh, sorry with four th with 4000 first hidden layers connected to to 2000 other, uh, other hidden uh, hidden uh, nodes in the layer using all the input features and training basically a relationship between hits with the probability are those hits from one uh, from one track with a massive training effort uh, and then in the in the uh, prediction reconstruction basically unraveling uh, this uh, take hit pairs uh, judge the, the 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 probability that they belong together and then build tracks from that that worked extremely well but the the uh, execution day due to the loop overall pairs is uh, let's put it uh, roughly one day per event <laughs> uh, i'll put it there and this uh, then was followed up by uh, by our third uh, um, uh, position which is uh, uh, sergey who is uh, who's a member of our community of the hep community uh, that has uh, written a classical approach of uh, combinatorial uh, so seeding and track following with a with a track model, uh, and uh, and uh, gained the third prize with that. Then we had some additional prizes. Uh, we gave uh, an innovation prize uh, from the jury. We had the juries uh, assembled together. We had uh, one prize uh, uh, that was a p that looked at only clustering solution. We had a deep learning prize and an organizer's pick. And just to give you an idea about the deep learning prize, uh, this was. Uh, the uh, Liam and, and Nicole Finney, who wrote actually an uh, uh, RNN solution where they, they trained an RNN uh, by giving, uh, I give you five hits, which were uh, obtained by simple DB scan clustering, and then used a, a recurrent neural network to predict the next five hits. Uh, and that uh, gave them the seventh place. But since this was such a unique way to look at it, uh, we, we decided to, uh, to award them the, uh, the uh, deep learning prize. Uh, a little bit aftermath of the phase one is, uh, did we do well in the score? So we looked uh, at the score uh, stability and we were very pleased to see that. You see here the score quartiles and extrema of, of the submitted solutions. So there was really no fluctuation uh, or, or, uh, or statistical problem to rank the contestants uh, according to the score which gave us quite a good confidence that we've picked that correct. And we looked uh, whether the score actually resembles uh, some physics quantities. And yes, it did. So you can see here the top uh, solutions. And you can also see how, how they, they compare to tracking efficiency. So on the left, you see basically tracking efficiency versus uh, different uh, detector or, or track uh, quantities. And you can actually see that high score means high tracking efficiency. So, so the score actually resembled physics. Um, we also try to digest a little bit what are the difficult, uh, the, uh, the different track uh, uh, classifications of, or uh, um, types that uh, people found. And that's very interesting. You can see there is a few um, really uh, outstanding uh, solutions. And that led us to look a little bit how the solutions internally are correlated. So this is the next slide on 30. You see 
uh, you see practically how close different solutions are when you just take the, the solution submission, submissions and, and, and check the correlation distance. Uh, it's quite interesting that number one and number two who have done uh, uh, different solutions are also here separated from the classical HEP solution. So number three and number four were, were, were classical HEP uh, solutions. So it tells us that by running different algorithms, you can see a different uh, type of the event. So I think that's a, a really nice outcome of that. Now let's uh, move to, to the second phase, which was uh, the same, the, uh, repeating this phase, uh, this challenge, but looking at the, at the speed uh, of the algorithm as well. For this, we augmented the score we had, uh, we had in the first phase with an execution time. And to do that, we had to really work with the CodaLab uh, team to, to create a setup where we, where we basically have the, the event in memory, have a public API to call for the users and then measure in a controlled environment the user executable. This is one of the first challenges where this has actually been done. Now let's look at the score evolution in phase two. You can see basically how this runs, a, runs along. One thing you see is there's way less submissions. Of, uh, we would have plotted more if we had way more. I'll come to this later. But you see how the scores basically approach. And if you look at the final score map, there's an extremely interesting correlation. You can see that the fastest solution are also the, the, the most accurate one, except for one outlier. And this, this, I think, should tell you something. If you do something right, you're fast at it. Uh, final leaderboard uh, from the 650 <laughs> in the first phase. For the second round, only seven teams made the cut meaning they either uh, time, didn't time out or, or, or um, uh, have, have been at least above zero in their accuracy. Uh, this tells us also something that the solution uh, to our problem is so difficult that the entry level uh, for, for doing that uh, filters out a lot, a lot of people. Uh, very quickly through the solutions, uh, I don't have to say a lot because a lot of this have been taken on uh, on solutions from the phase one and i think this is also very interesting and good about the challenge that people either the same authors or you will see different authors pick up solutions from another phase and modify them um the 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 winning solution was sergey who came third in phase one he took the same algorithm uh ran it iteratively uh, iteratively 80 uh times and uh, wrote a massive uh, parameter uh, optimization. So he optimized the roughly 10,000 parameters in order to not do any wrong lookups, et cetera. And he sped up his algorithm to become into a Hertz level, which is an amazing achievement. So less than a Hertz uh, is, is running um, half, half a second for, for this. Phase two is also a HEP member. Uh, he is a rather similar solution uh, in terms of combina uh, combinatorial approach, but with a very, uh, a very nice uh, uh, addition. It basically builds a, a, a graph and then to estimate whether the hit is great or not, it traverses the graph uh, uh, with, an, with a common filter. And uh, this is also extremely fast, uh, was about one second per event with the same accuracy. And the third solution, and that's the last one I present here, is uh, actually someone who took the winning solution of uh, phase one, looked at the the uh, the uh, the slow parts and replaced them with a direct uh, ecliptic graph uh, solution, which was pre-trained trained in the neural network doublet and triplet finder, and fed it back into the algorithm and uh, won the third prize on that. Key lessons: my last slide uh, uh, on phase one. Huge interest in the in and outside the community. Uh, of course, the reputation of Kaggle as a platform helped. Um, it was good that we have uh, we took a lot of time in having the the the, uh, the score defined, and we saw that the HEP code is or remains more than competitive, uh, and people with the domain knowledge actually have had a, a a boost. And phase two, we saw the entry barrier was high. Uh, uh, probably too high, but that's the problem, and I think uh, that's good to to spot out also. And we also see that the HEP code is currently the best we have, but alternative solutions are not lacking too far behind. Few spin-offs of this, the data set is now used all over the place in R&D projects, uh, from quantum computing to more uh, ML learning, uh, et cetera. We are uh, evolving this uh, detector into an open data detector project 
uh, that is in the finalization of validating. And then we want to have a data set which is even more realistic for people to, to train. And we certainly have built up a, a, a community which you can, uh, you can see by following basically follow up workshops, etc., seminar talks. My conclusions uh, for this project, it was great to work on it. Uh, took us quite some years to, from the initial idea to, to have it uh, executed and it ran very successfully. We had a huge uh, resonance in and outside the field. Uh, we connected uh, the, the data science ML community with the HEP tracking community. Would we have seen more ML solution? Probably, but I think that's the picture right now in reconstruction machine learning. We are there where this is a runner-up system. I'm not going to replace, be replaced by a, by a robot uh, 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 next year, but <laughs> who knows? And we'll have some spin-off that remains from it. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Andy. So uh, we, we probably could have time for a quick uh, couple of questions. People want to raise their hands. Or just speak up. So Andy, assuming you haven't actually been replaced by a robot already, and with all of these Zoom meetings, who knows? Um, <laughs> I wonder, uh, do you uh, think that the, there's sort of ongoing interest from outside our community? You talked about the open data and the, the detector model. Is this something that we can continue to sort of attract ideas from the outside of HEP? Uh, yes, and there is one component which uh, which I haven't uh, which I have not uh, mentioned here would uh, would belong into another session like the outreach session. It also has a huge educational and out, uh, outreach uh, potential. I mean, you can imagine having this sort of data set prepared for universities uh, and and like learn and also teach. Uh, event reconstruction uh, and uh, at an earlier stage, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, I think that's that's uh, that's also one uh, one addition. There is also professional interest on that. Uh, uh, data sets, complex data sets, are interesting for for companies to 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 test the algorithms. Yeah, and uh, uh, we are we're constantly in contact with uh, with. Uh, people who, who say, can we use this, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, so I don't see any more hands up and, and time is uh, running away from us. So uh, let's move on and uh, we'll change topic a little bit. So Martin is going to tell us about uh, detecting erratic server behavior using machine learning. So uh, take it away, Martin. So hello, uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I'm Martin. I'll be talking about um, erratic server detection behavior. So we'll be talking about operation efficiency for a bit now, but we'll stay with, with machine learning. So this was a project I did in cooperation with the CERN ID, uh, IT, and I would like to thank them in advance. Anyway, the topic of this, of this project was if you have a history of a run of a distributed application or uh, of the of the cluster of servers that's running the application, is it possible to detect an erratic server within the cluster only by looking at the OS level metrics uh, that were collected? Now, by OS level metrics, I'm talking about the CPU utilization, the memory usage, and and so on and so forth. So this is what we'll be talking now. Uh, now, the goals of this project was first to gather a data set because we found out that, that there is no data set that could actually help us answer this question. And then there was to train the machine learning model on, on the data and uh, see whether it actually works and whether the, this hypothesis is, is correct or whether we cannot do that. So first about gathering the data set. Uh, what the data set had to have. So it was supposed to be consisted of OS metrics from a cluster of hopefully equal servers. So there won't be any, any problems that we don't know about. And all the servers should be running some low, well load balanced application. So the idea was that all the servers should behave more or less the same. 
the metrics in the data set were supposed to be easily correlated so if, uh, we can detect more advanced anomalies and then obviously to capture some anomalies for us to detect now for gathering the data set we were using the cern monit which is a monitoring infrastructure that's used by the cern it department and it, as you can see on this image it's rather complex but we will be using only this let's say walk through the whole architecture so the OS metrics are collected by the collect the daemon, then they are stored in the Kafka cluster, which you can imagine is like a 72 hour cache. They can be uh, enriched and aggregated using uh, the Spark distributed computing engine. And then they were stored in HDFS from which we were doing the analysis of the metrics using Swan and then again Spark. Now, uh, the collect the metrics in the Monit are uh, not in a great format as you see so uh, you have the host name then you have the the type of the metric in text and then you have the value and the timestamp sadly uh, this 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 is not great for correlation right so uh, even worse is that the the individual plugins on a host don't report at the same time so you can have cpu reported and at one minute and then the memory usage reported at another minute and something can happen during that time and obviously it's not uh, synchronized over the whole cluster so so that was bad so the first thing we did was we aggregated those metrics on a 20 minute time window which was fixed i mean the time windows were fixed along the whole cluster so we had something um, something rigid and then we joined the individual metrics on the time window and on the host name forming this long vector of metrics which somehow represented the status of the host during those 20 minutes uh, the aggregation also provided some whitening which was which was good and uh, yeah so th this was this was the input data for the algorithms and if i refer to something as a service status snapshot this is what i'm meaning now uh, this aggregation and joining was done uh, using two spark streaming jobs in the in the monitor infrastructure obviously the first one was doing the the aggregation the second one was doing the joining now why i'm saying is this that uh, this was quite compute intensive because the sheer amount of uh, collect the metrics in the monitor infrastructure it's about 13 megabytes per second throughput so the aggregation job had to scan through all of this, do the uncompression, aggregation, and then output. Uh, so we had to run quite uh, a hefty uh, streaming job. It uh, took around 25, 30 CPUs, and it consumed about 120 gigs of RAM. So this was, uh, this was actually quite a task then the joining job it was uh, it was uh, a bit simpler it only took about 10 gigagram but it had to keep a lot of status because it was joining all the different metric streams so uh, it was it was quite a challenge now uh, the anomalies so first we thought that uh, we'll just be analyzing the anomalies that uh, occur naturally in the data but it turns out that uh, with the application that we chose, which was the Kafka streaming service, which is quite a well load balanced application, uh, there are not that many anomalies taking place. So um, we actually decided to create our own anomalies. Now, we thought of four kinds of anomalies. First one was to stop the service altogether. Second one was simulating some sort of a memory leak. The fourth one was simulating some sort of a a uh, loop stuck or something like that so it was just overusing the cpu and then the last one was just combining both anomalies together simulating some sort of uh let's say um, virus or something which is consuming resources without the the admin actually knowing about that now we can see the the anomaly counts that we were able to capture are not as high as we would like uh, initially we were aiming at at least 10 anomalies per per type turns out that uh, no one wants to let you screw up their servers in production so we had to use a testing cluster but the testing cluster was for testing so 
there were not that many times that the testing cluster was actually running stably which we needed to um, you know to simulate stable uh, production right um, anyway we captured 26 anomalies they were spread over over 19 days so sometimes we inserted two anomalies per day but essentially even if we meddled with the cluster the the, the operations were still rather smooth and each of uh, the sequence of anomalies were preceded by about three days of stable operations, which we used to uh, train the, uh, the models, but uh, more about that later. Now, in terms of the metric count, we first hand selected 10 metrics from the, the selection, but later we just said, oh, okay, let's, let's collect all of them and, and see how the algorithms do. So later we collect all 36 of the metrics. Now to the data analytics. Uh, first, we needed to do some pre-processing because even 10 metrics can be uh, a bit too much for some of the algorithms. So we, uh, and also we knew that some of the metrics are correlated. So we looked at the principal component analysis or PCA. Uh, uh, here are the um, explained variances per component of PCA. So we said, oh, okay, if we go with uh, three or in some cases five metrics, uh, we will capture most of the information that is indeed in the data while uh, getting rid of, of a huge chunk of the, of the space. So from now on, when I'll be talking about PCA uh, reduced dimensions, I'll be talking about only three dimensions, which was, which was nice. And the algorithms ran, ran a bit better. Now, first we uh, tried to do some unsupervised learning. First, uh, we did some clustering, which is just uh, automatic grouping of points together uh, within some sort of a intelligent algorithm. Now this worked rather well when there was indeed an anomaly in in the in the day. So we can see that the, okay these points are, are somehow anomalous and they are grouped together. But when there was no anomaly, we didn't really knew how to detect that, right? Because these points were split more or less equally, and then they were switching back and forth. And uh, yeah, we, we didn't really knew how, how to move forward. So we looked at some novelty detection algorithms. This is uh, some like nugget finding and, you know, exactly the thing that we were trying to do. So we used some uh, scikit-learn um, implemented algorithms and uh, you can see the precision and recall here. Now, the precision isn't even 80%, which is bad because the one thing we don't want to do is present the operators with some false positives. Now the recall isn't great either. So if you can manage to catch only 30% of the, of the anomalies, it's, it's not pretty good. But we can see what type of algorithms might uh, work better in, in, uh, in the future. Uh, and by future, I mean supervised learning. So. Uh, by supervised learning, we mean that uh, the algorithm gets some input data and tries to output some uh, something that you actually tell him to, right? And, and this is how you train the algorithm. Now, we didn't want it to do a pure classification, meaning we didn't want it to, you know, present the algorithm, okay, this is a status snapshot and it's erratic, and this is a status snapshot and it's not erratic because uh, then we will train the algorithm only to recognize the um, anomalies that we created. And uh, what do we know? Maybe they are completely, uh, well, not completely, but uh, we just didn't want it to do that, right? So what we thought of doing instead was giving the algorithms a couple of statuses from the history of the run of the specific server and let it predict the next status, right? Now, as you remember, the status snapshot is, is a vector of, of some metrics, uh, which is uh, three when we use PCA or 10 or 36 when we don't use it. Uh, sadly, we had to uh, train uh, algorithm uh, model per model for each of them. So uh, to, to do this prediction, you had to train a lot of models. Now, uh, to give the model some idea about what's happening in the cluster, we also pasted together the status of the current server with the state, uh, status average of, of the cluster, as you can see here. 
and let the, the model do its best. Now, uh, we looked at three models. Uh, the baseline was just to say, okay, so the predicted statuses was the last one we saw. And since the, the operations were rather stable, it actually worked quite well. Then we tried to use a linear regression, which is just a linear combination of the outputs, which uh, actually, again, stable operations, so uh, worked pretty well as well. And then we used the random forest regressor, which is a combined output of, of uh, many decision trees to uh, produce the prediction. Uh, this was just to um, see how a more complicated algorithm will do. Now, because the input data space was quite large, we were restricted by the offers of the Spark ML library to, to do this. Uh, so this is why we went with, with those uh, algorithms that you can see here. Now, uh, okay, so we have the prediction, but how do we uh, get the anomaly, right? So what we thought about was we will compare the predicted status with the actual status that we see and uh, compute the prediction error. From that, we see whether the point is actually anomalous or, or not. Now, uh, here you can see how the prediction error changes. This is when the anomaly started here and then here. Note that this is for the baseline algorithm, so the the, the initial spike is, is not that big. And then, uh, interestingly, we have quite a big spike at the end of the anomaly, and uh, I will talk about it a bit later. For uh, the random forest regressor, which is a bit, um, well, which is much more advanced, you can see that the first peak is, is a bit wider, which, uh, which is good, and then the second peak is a bit lower, but it's still there. Now, uh, we actually... Uh, Three minutes, more. Okay. We actually, it turns out that this is exactly what you expect, right? Because when you take out the server from the cluster, it has to somehow update its status, right? So in the end of the anomaly, it actually does a lot of work. Now, fine, uh, this is then to be expected. Uh, so how do we get uh, a Boolean, uh, whether that was anomalous or not? We said, okay, uh, we will say that something is anomaly if the mean error for that data point is larger than the, if the error for, is, is larger than the mean error over the errors and then uh, three times the uh, the deviance. So this is your classic three sigma rule. Now, if we apply this this algorithm at the uh, at the example that I showed you earlier, you see that it it uh, quite well captures the the anomaly there. But we also have some false positives, which are from other hosts, which were pro probably updating our anomalous host with with the data that it has to catch up with. So we said, okay, let's say that uh, we will count this as anomaly only if the algorithm uh, classifies it as such twice in a row. Thus, we get a bit of a, a retardation, but uh, we also get zero false positives, which was amazing. Uh, in terms of recall, uh, we saw about 70% recall with the with PCA, and then we also did a random forest run without PCA on all the 36 metrics. And we saw a recall of 78% there, which we said is uh, is quite actually good. We were really happy about that. Now, a bit interesting here is that we could uh, see which of the metrics were important to the to the classification and which were not. So CPU idle, running process load, and CPU system were the most important. And uh, some of the others didn't uh, contribute to the classification at all. Now, in the future, if this were to use in production, we would have to automatize the training because at the moment I was doing the training uh, manually and especially selecting the the times where the cluster was running stable by hand and then training the model then. Uh, we would also have to uh, port the algorithms to do an analytic detection on streaming data. And we will have to improve the stability of the streaming jobs because they were quite large and uh, the stability wasn't, wasn't great. I had to uh, keep an eye on the run more or less all the time. 
Now, at the end of my presentation, I would like to thank the ITCM MM and especially Luca Magnoni with, with all the help that he, he gave me. And uh, it's time for questions. Super, thanks very much, Martin. So, uh, questions? Yeah, if I may, can make one question. As you know, as a co-host, I cannot uh, raise my hand. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, all right. Thanks. That, that, that's very nice. This, uh, this, this uh, what what you have done, and uh, also I mean, goes in the direction of uh, automatizing operations. Uh, that uh, we all know it's uh, it's a very uh, hot topic uh, for for whoever is doing uh, experiment operations. So I'm wondering uh, um, how you can uh, I mean how we can use uh, this this machinery for uh, uh, other uh, to, to monitor other uh, features like I mean uh, experimental services on, on VO boxes on, so on and so forth. I mean we have a distributed infrastructure for instance that we want to monitor uh, its service that uh, we want to monitor. I mean I, I guess my question is uh, uh, do you plan to put uh, your uh, your work and development so, somewhere so that uh, others can uh, start uh, working from it? I see what you mean. So, um, firstly, the the main, um, let's say, cornerstone that this project was standing on was that the application has to be somehow load balanced. So if you have just one VO box per site, or maybe even two, I don't think that's, that's sadly enough. On the other hand, if you have a cluster of, say, database servers, it would be perfectly suited for that, especially if, if they are more or less loaded the, the same way. Now, uh, we were planning on, um, on trying this approach out for, for different applications, but uh, sadly, we haven't had the time yet, but uh, it is indeed planned. Uh, to answer your second question, now, uh, the, the, the idea is, is there, and uh, it turns out it, it works, and it, it might work quite well. Uh, the work I did was very specific to the to the Monit infrastructure. So the Monit team obviously has access to, to all this work and and uh, maybe if you're at CERN and, and if, you, if you want to try it out, uh, they, 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 they will let you or, or just contact me and, and yeah, yeah, I'll that's, arrange that's it good. somehow. But uh, from, from outside CERN, I'm afraid that most of the work will have to be done uh, uh, customly for your monitoring infrastructure, whatever that might be. So. Uh, yeah, but it turns out if, if you do the work, you might actually see some some good results. No, no, that's exactly why I asked because in LHCB we are doing a lot of collaboration with the monitoring team, and so I mean, if uh, if this can be extended to this uh, to this kind of studies, this would be great. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, just let know the the monitoring team or shoot me an email, and we can arrange something. I guess the other thing which might be generalizable from it is. Uh, which are the ML algorithms which can best detect the, um, the anomalies. And that will be very interesting to, to know that could be used by other people in other infrastructures. Anyway, very good. So um, thank you, Martin, and also to Andy and Davide for this nice session. So we'll go to the break now, and uh, then we'll resume at 10.40 uh, Prague time. So uh, see you in a little bit. Okay, thank you. So we get ready to uh, start up again. So, Mikhail, uh, maybe you share your screen. Okay, so I hope you can see me and my slides. Yep. And let me know when I can start. Okay, that's uh, gone 20 to 11, so I think you can take it away. Very well, so good morning. Uh, what I will be talking about is basically overview of uh, Atlas distributed computing and where we stand between run two and run three with outlook to high room LHC. 
and uh, with a little bit of focus on what these changes uh, can imply on uh, analyzers. So let's start with a bit of introduction. I think I don't need to spend a lot of time on introducing Atlas experiment. It is big experiment, both in terms of uh, size and in terms of uh, collaboration uh, size. So uh, with uh, thousands of people participating, uh, also the computing si uh, size needs to be significant. So a uh, bit of introduction of uh, Atlas Distributed Computing. It manages resources on 100, 100 maybe more sites, which represents about half exabyte of data and uh, more than 400K CPU cores, and it runs nonstop. Uh, there is a, a little bit of split of sites depending on uh, their capabilities. So you can see it on the map, there's TU0, which is CERN, and that is largest resource and also has all the vector data and they are archived on tape. There are tier ones, they are usually the largest uh, computing centers and they also have usually have tape and store the second copy. Then tier twos, which are small, not, not always that much smaller uh, computing sites and then tier threes, which are small sites sometimes only used for uh, local users and local analysis. For the comp components of ADC, we have workload management. This is basically how to submit jobs to the resources. So Proces is a component which organizes uh, jobs into tasks, tasks into requests, and manages this whole, whole workflow. And then there's Panda Jedi, which uh, deals with submission of these jobs into uh, various resources. For data management, we have Rusio, which uh, manages uh, storage, the access, the replication, the edition, everything. And uh, it seems to be that it seems that uh, Rusio is becoming more or less standard in uh, high energy physics community as many other experiments other than Atlas are using it. And then there are additional components like information system, which is now AGIS and so to be Greek. We have uh, uh, monitoring and analysis platforms, etc. For current status, uh, as I said, we have about 400k cores. On the plot, you see the usage uh, from the beginning of this year. So most of the uh, resources are coming from grid, grid which are uh, uh, WSCG grid sites, but then there are also cloud resources. And this also includes uh, a point 0.1 farm, which has about 90,000 cores. And then there are HPCs, uh, Boeing, etc. For storage, uh, as I said, we have about half exabyte of space, which is more or less split half and half between tape and disk. On disk, uh, uh, majority of formats uh, are analysis, which I will show later. And the problem is that disks are always full. And most of the data are primary copies, so it means that uh, they cannot be deleted and uh, there's only a limited amount of uh, cached secondary data which can be deleted if it is necessary. Uh, we have various mechanism of uh, coping with this. We delete unused data uh, and old analysis formats if they have newer versions, etc. For the run three and uh, especially high Lumi LHC outlook, uh, I as I, everyone know, I guess uh, the uh, performance of uh, LHC is supposed to improve a lot. So we expect to have uh, more order of magnitude more data, which needs to be stored, processed, analyzed, etc. 
So the problem is that the computing budget is assumed to stay flat and uh, the additional resources we got from technology advancements, this is decreasing. Uh, you, see, you see on the middle plot, this is uh, price over performance evolution at CERN. So like 10 or 15 years ago, it was decreasing quite nicely as you got more performance for the same amount of money. But uh, recent times it is slowing or it is actually increasing sometimes. So you need to pay more to get the same performance. Uh, on the right, you see predictions for CPU and disk usage. So I could say that for run three, we could manage to run with the current system, but for a high room LHC, we need uh, aggressive R&D to be able to fit with uh, available resources. So I uh, will give you some examples of uh, R&D, like uh, there's new analysis model uh, plant uh, improvements in software, uh, tape usage, uh, access to compute, etc. So let's start with uh, the analysis model. The current model is there's um, a centralized data reduction system that is using output of uh, reconstruction, which are AODs and produced so-called DODs or derived AODs. And uh, the content is created from AODs. You can remove from object or variable or even whole event or add something. And this is, can be, this is something that can be tailored for specific analysis by analysis teams. On the plot, you see that AOD and DAOD represent like three quarters of all data on the disk. So another point is that uh, DAOD overlap a lot. So this, this is causing a heavy footprint on the disk. Uh, to solve this, there's new analysis model in preparation, which uh, proposes two new uh, formats, which is DOD FIS and FIS Lite. FIS having about 50 kilobytes per event and FIS Lite about 10. Of course, not all analysis uh, can be covered by this, but majority should be using uh, these formats. And also for analyzers, this uh, causes advantage that uh, with smaller size, uh, we can keep more copies. So uh, the availability for analyzers will improve. Uh, on a side note, uh, it is planned to be rather flat, so it can integrate better with uh, Python-based analysis ecosystem. And uh, at the side note is uh, there's investigation on application of uh, lossy compression, which could uh, save space, but it's tricky to not affect the uh, physics in, in the input files for the analysis. For software, uh, start with event generations. So uh, this is expected that uh, next to reading order and next next to reading order precision will be needed. So that uh, means uh, a lot of computing resource resources will need to be spent. Uh, with event generators, the problem is that they are not product of collaboration. They're, so we do not control them. We have kind of influence on what can be done. So there are a few ways we can decrease the resource usage. So we can choose quite carefully what kind of physics we will generate. We can bias the event generation as a function of kinematic, uh, kinematic so the, you, uh, you don't spend a lot of CPU time uh, populating some extreme corner of uh, phase space. Uh, uh, uncertainties from scales and PDFs can be done by rebating, so you do not need uh, some large uh, Monte Carlo to do that. Also, as this is uh, experiment independent, we can share them with other experiments. Uh, in this case, uh, it would be probably uh, mostly with CMS. For simulation, which is uh, 
uh, modeling of interaction of uh, particles with the detector. There are many of these uh, projects in Atlas and JAN4. Uh, we have uh, so called full sim and fast sim. Full sim is uh, based on JAN4, and fast sim is uh, based on parameterization of the calorimeter response. So on the right, you see that uh, most of the uh, CPU usage is for full simulation, but as far as event processed, uh, the most of them coming from fast simulation because they are just so much faster. So uh, the ratio between full simulation and fast simulation needs to change and we need to use more uh, fast simulation. For digitization, which is modeling of output of the detector, uh, the plan is to use pre-mixed uh, pileup data sets and then the hard scatter events will be digitized and then uh, kind of overlaid on the top of uh, these uh, pre-mixed events, which is considerably faster, has better I.O. and scales better with uh, luminosity. The problem is that these uh, pre-mixed uh, events need to stay on disk and uh, this could mean uh, a lot of uh, permanently blocked storage. Uh, uh, as right now, I don't have a really number of uh, how many petabytes this can be, but it could be significant. For reconstruction, which is uh, creating of high-level objects, I just uh, can make a general uh, remark about uh, ACTS, which is uh, common tracking software, which is open source project to develop uh, tracking software. Uh, so improvements in compute, uh, first I need to say a bit about how we can split the jobs in Atlas. So there's production, which is basically running from raw or event generation to AODs. And this is done centrally and uh, under control of very few people. And then there's analysis, which is uh, which analyzes that uh, are using the AODs usually. So uh, on the plots on the right, you see that as far as CPU usage, this is a small uh, amount of uh, resources used. But in terms of files used, uh, this is uh, dominating because uh, uh, the analysis are IO heavy. And currently we are uh, going into process of grant unification. Uh, I guess it's almost all, which is uh, basically a way to unify access to, to sites so we can decide what is the share between analysis and production. And uh, this can lead to increase in utilization of for analysis at one site and decrease in other depending on availability of uh, input data. And by this, uh, analyzers can get faster there uh, to their input and get a faster turnaround for the analysis. Uh, another thing is containerization. So uh, right now, almost all jobs are running inside the container, which is singularity, but uh, there's plan for, uh, and the work is going on, uh, uh, user-based uh, containers where you can all uh, your software you need uh, inside and you don't need any complicated setup or ask someone to install something or for data pre uh, preservation. Another... Uh, Two minutes more, Michael. Okay. Uh, another thing are Jupyter notebooks which uh, where you can do interactive analysis in Python either on some horizontal scale but cluster or batch system if it would allow kind of specific uh, scheduling. Uh, for usage of disk, there's data carousel project, which is a sliding window approach uh, to orchestrate data processing. So basically you stage only data from tape to disk, which are needed for currently running tasks, not like all year or whole run two data and this was tested and works rather really well with uh, out of uh, 18 petabytes of run two data uh, was uh, only a small amount always on the disk. 
So to summarize, uh, uh, high mileage, especially about also around three, uh, will be very challenging. Uh, the current uh, computing model is not sustainable for high mileage, so there are many improvements needed by the ADC and uh, aggressive R&D to make uh, to store the data, process them, and make them available for physicists, and also to give them uh, means to analyze them. So I give example analysis model software improvements, improvements in access to compute or in disk and tape usage, etc. Great, thank you very much, Mikhail. You've covered a lot of ground there. So uh, let's open the floor to questions. We certainly have time. Uh, Nicole? Uh, Mikhail, thank you uh, for the talk. Um, in terms of fast simulation methods, you mentioned that your your biggest adoption is the parameterization of the, the color, colorimetry system. Mm -hmm. uh, this is obviously slightly different to LHCB in terms of what we're using. Um, what I mean, are there are there other ones you're you're using as well, or is it mainly this? Well, it's supposed to be the whole chain, uh, fast DG, fast recall, and uh, fast uh, uh, same and in several versions. So it's, uh, I, I don't really know you know details to give you example of, of parameterization, but uh, there, there's a lot of R&D there. Okay, cool, thanks. We certainly have time for other questions. Yeah, I was curious about your um, derived ALD uh, reduced format, I mean, FIS and FIS light. I mean, how do you accomplish this? You do, do you foresee a single um, structure or do you foresee selective persistency according to the analysis that is going to use those data? I mean, how well, do you plan? The content of uh, FIS and FIS light is actually still being investigated and it is, I think we have found some first versions and it's being evaluated by uh, analysis groups if uh, the content is okay. Uh, so for some special analysis, we might need some another DAUDs or even use AUDs for analysis, but for, uh, let's say normal analysis, these two should be enough. The difference would be, I guess, the AODFIS could uh, have some more uh, data on trigger or uh, calibration, et cetera. Maybe if, if I may comment on, on this, uh, if, you, if you do a, 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 a reduction of this size, you do, I think you have to do on both, uh, both ends. You need to work on on the technical side, uh, on smarter storage, uh, compression, uh, and of course by cutting out uh, things that uh, that are are not used or can be uh, uh, recomputed. So I think this is really a mix of uh, of um, of uh, actions that need to be taken. Uh. Thanks, Andy. James, do you want to make a quick comment on this? Or sorry? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, the main difference between this model and the model we used last time uh, is that uh, previously we had all these different formats, uh, 84 of them, which were skimmed according to the needs of the analysis groups. Uh, what we observed is the per event content uh, was roughly the same. And these were the variables that were needed uh, to do the apply calibrations or uh, run various systematics. So this new, and, and as, uh, as um, Mikhail said, because there were so many of them, particularly with Monte Carlo, they would very strongly overlap. So we're writing out the same data over and over again. So these two new formats are not skimmed. The first one, DAOD FIS, it contains all of these variables that are required for applying calibrations, etc. And that's the one that we will generally use in, uh, in run three. Uh, it can be skimmed centrally if, if necessary for those groups who only require a very small number of events. Now, FIS light, um, the idea there is that it's pre-calibrated, so we can throw away most of the variables that are needed 
uh, to apply the calibration because it's already done. Uh, this is going to be uh, used in uh, primarily in run four, but of course it needs quite some commissioning because it's a much more complicated uh, way, of, way of working on such a small format. And then yes, finally, as, as Mikhail said, certain specialized analyses will still need extra information which is not available in this DAOD FIS, and they will continue with the model that we roughly use in, uh, in run, in run uh, two. Okay, I hope that was uh, added a bit of extra background to this. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, thanks very much, James. Uh, well, I think we should uh, move on, but remind people that we do have matter most who want to carry on the discussion. Uh, so next up is uh, Nicole, who will tell us about the evolution of the LHCB offline computing towards run three. Uh, yep, and let me just try sharing my screen. This one. Okay. Um, we'll try and make it full screen. So it's bigger. Yeah, let me just move this out of the way so we don't have a problem with last one. Yeah, that's very good. Okay, excellent. Great. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Nicole. Uh, I'm a, a postdoc at the University of Bonn. And uh, I'm very happy to be talking about the evolution of the LHCB offline computing uh, towards the run free uh, upgrade. So um, just a recap of what our LHCB detector looked like in run one and run two. As you know, LHCB is a forward arm spectrometer specializing in the decays of beauty and charm hadrons. And on the right, you can see a plot of our integrated luminosity um, throughout the years of run one and run two. And in total, we collected uh, nine investment demands of data. And um, as you'll see from the many talks in this conference, we're, we're fully exploiting this now. But obviously, this talk is, is focused on the upgrade. And we expect an instantaneous luminosity uh, increase of factor five. And you can see the various uh, sub-detector changes uh, we're making. But from a computing point of view, the big change is a new uh, fully software uh, trigger. And uh, the big news is that our HLT1 will uh, run on uh, GPUs. So in essence, we're expecting a data rate increase by factor 30 uh, in the upgrade compared to run two. And um, this talk is going to talk a little bit about how we how we deal with the challenges that come with this in the, the offline data processing. So we can start with the, the data flow evolution, uh, looking at the persistency models uh, that we had in run two. So when we trigger on event, uh, what parts of the event do we actually save? So the minimum, of course, you can save is to just save the reconstructed objects involved in the trigger decay candidate. So if you're triggering on the signal of a D0 to K pi, you just save the reconstructed K pi objects. And this is what we call a turbo stream. Sort of then moving down, sort of increasing the amount we save in each event, we have turbo selective pers persistence or turbo SP, where we can save additional reconstructed objects. So in the, in the case you see here, we're saving um, objects that come from the same primary vertex, uh, primary vertex as our signal decay. And this is customizable. You can, you can choose exactly what other parts of the event you save. And then at the other extreme, we, we have the full, what we know as full stream, where we save the whole raw event. Um, and this was actually the only thing we had um, in run one. So all the run one analyses used the, the full stream uh, where we save the entire uh, raw event. Now in run two, most of the physics did use uh, this full persistency model. And of course, because we're saving the raw event, what this meant is that the raw event came out the, or the raw data came out the trigger, and it would need to be re-reconstructed offline. And then because of the, the event size still being uh, large, it then had to go through this uh, stripping step, we called it, which is just a slimming uh, and skimming of the data, such that it could be small enough to be saved to disk, where of course um, our analysts can um, use it. But we did have a, quite a good uptake of Turbo and Turbo SP, uh, mainly for our, our charm program. And here, obviously, the reconstructed objects were taken from a trigger. And then there's just a very minor file reformatting need to be done before we can straight, uh, save the data straight to uh, disk. This is why uh, it's called Turbo, of course. 
Now in the upgrade, um, due to um, huge developments on the, the reconstruction alignment and calibration of our subdetectors, all the reconstruction will be performed uh, online. So we can sort of get rid of this uh, offline uh, stages here. Um, so of course we will have our, our turbo and turbo selected persistence, which again will be immediately available on disk. Now the full stream will save the full uh, reconstructed event. So in principle, the raw data can be removed uh, at this point. We have a third stream known as uh, TURCAM. Uh, this is used for calibration purposes, not physics analysis as such, where we save the full reconstructed event and then some raw detector information for uh, calibration purposes. So with this new uh, persistency model, we, we can't save, of course, all this HLT output straight to disk. So we want to utilize cheapest tape storage to take the bulk of the bandwidth. And that really is basically the, the full stream. And we're going to have to rely on a central offline slimming and skimming um, to get this data small enough to go to disk. So you can see here the two models that we have. So the default model is for the turbo or turbo SP model. Uh, and all physics that can should obviously uh, adopt this model, uh, where the, the event size is, is small enough such that it can be saved to disk. The sprucing model is for the full and turcal streams, where between the data being saved to tape and disk, we have this further offline stage of uh, data reduction and selection. Um, the key design choice here is that the, the selection framework in the sprucing is the same as that in HLT2. Uh, that has a number of benefits, but ultimately you're, you're dealing with the same selections online and offline, which is, is beneficial for, for many reasons. So the use cases we see for the, the sprucing model are, are things like topological triggers, where you have to save significant amounts of the event, um, inclusive triggers, and of course, uh, for use in uh, data mining, so, uh, we, which we profited off um, greatly in, in run one and run two analyses. Uh, in run two, we, we did actually have 29% of our physics rate uh, already going to turbo streams. So you can see in this table here, the sort of split between uh, where our physics was uh, going to which stream. But in the upgrade, of course, as I said, we've got a luminosity increase of factor five. The HLT efficiency will increase as we removed our level zero hardware trigger and the raw event size will increase just to the number of primary vertices in each uh, event. If we were to not change our sort of stream split with our physics, we'd have a HLT2 output of 17.4 uh, gigabits per second, which is obviously uh, unsustainable. So we're relying on a large fraction of our physics channels moving to the turbo model. And on the left, you can see our, our baseline uh, model here. So we're looking at 73% of our physics going to, to turbo stream, which gives us an output data volume um, of 10 uh, gigabytes a second. And this obviously requires a huge migration of physics selections uh, to the new HLT framework. And this effort's uh, ongoing and it's largely led by the physics and analysis working groups. The key is now that these selections obviously have to be optimized for speed um, because they will, they'll run offline, um, sorry, they'll run online, um, not offline anymore. The physics uh, that can't move to turbo uh, for whatever reason will obviously follow the sprucing model. And this slide really shows what um, the workload that the sprucing uh, will have to do. So on the left, you can see uh, the event rate and on the right, the throughput for what comes out the trigger, um, what gets stored to tape and what gets stored to disk. And you can see most, the event rate is, is dominated by the turbo stream, but the throughput is hugely dominated by the full stream just because of the event size. So the job of the sprucing is to get the full bandwidth from 59% um, to tape storage and then reduce it to 22% of the bandwidth going to uh, disk storage. Um, so that's, uh, that's the, the workload that the sprucing has to, uh, to deal with. So moving a little bit further down the analysis chain, um, obviously real data dominates our disk storage, but simulation dominates our CPU needs. And in fact, it takes 90% of our total offline CPU resources. So decreasing the time required to simulate uh, our Monte Carlo uh, is crucial if we're going to fully exploit the larger data sets in the upgrade. And indeed, we already have measurements that hint at standard model tensions 
uh, having systematic uncertainties but are dominated by our limited uh, simulation statistics. So far simulations are obviously crucial uh, for us in run three. And uh, already in run one and run two, we've had a, a really successful uh, adoption of, of some of these. So you can see in this pie chart here, 38% uh, of our, our simulation still uh, goes to full simulation, but 53% um, now uses Redecay. And LHCB has really uh, taken up uh, Redecay in a big way. Uh, it essentially reuses an underlying event, maybe a hundred times, but generates and simulates uh, a new signal decay uh, for each um, event. So, and you can see uh, speed increases of a factor 10 uh, to 20 here. There is a, a dedicated talk to this, uh, talk 516 by uh, Adam Morris, about how, how LHCB is uh, using this. So moving on to sort of the, the data tuples that our analysts use, um, in run one and run two, analysts um, created their tuples individually uh, using Ganga. Uh, this didn't, uh, didn't scale well, and it's not going to scale well for, for run three. Um, thousands of jobs, um, faulty jobs can be submitted instantly, and 10% and of our user jobs uh, fail. Uh, it's very time consuming, uh, on the order of, of weeks, to produce a run one, um, two tuple set. Uh, and you have to sort of babysit these, you have to resubmit the failed ones manually. And there's no analysis preservation sort of inbuilt into the system. So in run three, we want to move to submitting these jobs centrally using the direct transformation system. And we've termed these as analysis productions. And our Monte Carlo is actually already produced this way. And the nice thing is it doesn't require you to, to babysit the jobs as a direct transformation takes care of uh, this for you. In the prototype, we've, uh, we've developed the jobs can be tested automatically upon a merge request using the GitLab CI. The job details uh, and logs are automatically preserved either in the, the bookkeeping or the logs get, get sent to EOS. Um, there's a very nice automated uh, error interpretation and advice for when things do go wrong. And as you can see, the results are displayed like this on a, on a web page where you have um, all details about uh, how a tuple was created uh, and then this is obviously uh, preserved for um, forever. To, to make our tuples, we, we use uh, tuple tools, and these essentially just create and save um, a number of variable branches for typical use cases. So an example is uh, tuple tool track info. The problem with these is they're, they're very easy to implement, a couple of lines, but uh, it can add a lot of redundant branches to um, the tuple. And for a single run one, run two analysis, we can have anything from 500 gigabytes to 10 terabytes for the user to, to look at. And these tuples tend to only be used for one analysis. So for run three, we're looking at a major redesign of these tools to try and minimize the redundancy and to make this a more customizable thing. Uh, like the rest of the LHC, LHCB um, uses a wide range of tools, obviously C++, Python, and uh, an uptaking of uh, NumPy, uh, Pandas. Custom user environments, of course, uh, for use on the distributed computer system are limited by uh, the CVMS distributions, but we're experimenting with providing analysts the ability to install custom Condor environments on CVMS and also making use of singularity containers, which uh, we're already using to run uh, legacy applications on the grid and looking to expand this. Uh, a quick note on uh, our heterogeneous resources, as we know uh, from the last talk, uh, the grid, we have a million CPU cores um, at over 170 sites. Most of these sites have no GPUs yet, but there is a push towards uh, high performance computing centers, which could in principle provide large GPU resources. Also, uh, as I said, our, our HLT1 will now run on a GPU farm. And we'd like the ability to utilize that farm during detector downtime um, for jobs much like we do our current HLT CPU farm when LHCB isn't running. But to do this, we need to have a lot of development in our significant payloads to make them actually be able to run on GPUs. And you can see um, what jobs we run by job type on the right here. And user analyses are, are beginning to utilize um, GPUs. So for instance, use of TensorFlow for machine learning and fitting very complex amplitude models. But actually user jobs is quite a small share of our CPU. And indeed, most of our CPU is dedicated to detector simulation, um, but obviously GM4 uh, doesn't have GPU compatibility yet, but we, we're aware work is uh, ongoing outside LHCB on this. 
And then finally, obviously, GPU uh, batch cluster at CERN, um, which will help us develop and run our um, GPU workloads. So just a, a final note on um, our new data processing and analysis project or, or DPA project. Um, obviously, as I've, I've said, run-free uh, offline data volume necessitates a much more coordinated approach to the offline data processing. And uh, we now have this um, DPA project, which has five work packages addressing the various uh, issues that I've, I've mentioned in this talk. And this project will work very, very closely with the computing team to try and coordinate these efforts and uh, really make sure we can, we can handle the increase in data volume. So uh, in conclusion, obviously, like all the experiments, LHCB will have to process much more data uh, offline. Um, and we're progressing well um, to meet these demands, including uh, the treatment of our event persistency models and our, our sprucing, our central offline data processing. Uh, we've already adopted our simulation and we're, we're going to try and keep um, pushing that forward. Um, we want to push initiatives to use um, accelerators. And we have the creation of this new project uh, to work in collaboration with the computing team to really uh, coordinate these efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole. So that was a very nice overview. We certainly have time for some questions. So uh, maybe, maybe I'll ask um, so you talked about an towards the use of accelerators. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about the HLT1 moving to accelerator uh, for run three um, in LMCB. So it, it does assume that you did get a bunch of um, GPUs out there on the grid. Would you actually be able to use that usefully today? Um, and what would the next piece of software, if you were to put a big star on it, this is the next bit that I want to work. What would that be? So, uh, as I said, we, we have to put quite a lot of in development into to making our stuff work on uh, GPUs. The main one would obviously be the, the full simulation, but obviously this is slightly um, outside of LHCB. Um, I mean, we, we do have quite a lot of analyses now. You know, we have amplitude models with 100 fit parameters and you know hundreds of thousands of events and without these tensorflow type things that they would be impossible so i think they really they're incredibly useful at the user analysis level already um yeah that's what i, I would say we, we we would definitely use them for user analysis if i can add uh, uh, briefly to this uh, from the infrastructure point of view uh we are using the rack and there have been some prototype work in using a, 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 a cluster in Manchester uh, where jobs have been submitted. Uh, but uh, it's very, you have to tailor this very well. I mean, it's, it's not a generic submission system for GPUs. So if you have an application that can run on GPUs and you can target a single site, I, but uh, of course, uh, it's not, not more than a prototype. And this was done uh, within uh, the grid PPT Iraq installation. Thanks, Concetio. James? Hi, yes, so thanks for the nice talk. So I, I just wanted to ask about the analysis model that you described on slide 14. So the, yeah, I, I can, uh, I think every experiment has gone through this, uh, this realization that the creating n tuples uh, from direct user analysis is something that doesn't scale so well. I was wondering um, how big are the data products that the n tuples are being made from? So are, are they their sort of large uh, output of reconstruction level or they've already been significantly reduced at this stage or? Uh, so the, from run one and run two, these tuples are made after the, the stripping step. So they're made from the output of this step. So they're, they're already quite slimmed down. Um, yeah. 
And how, how many and how, how many different formats are there then that uh, for after the stripping? It's uh, after the stripping, but the output of the stripping is either DST or MDST. Um, those are the so if you're you're making tuples, basically you're using a, a DST. Right, so, it's, so the, the, the realization is that even running on these significantly stripped down formats, uh, running the uh, user analysis is still in, in, essentially not efficient enough to, to sustain a run three analysis. That, that's, the, that's the conclusion. Yeah, um, even now it takes on the order of a, a couple of weeks um, to take the, the stripping output to a tuple. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Nicole. That was uh, a very nice talk indeed. So let's move on to actually the last track, um, which is going to be on resource provisioning and workload scheduling uh, in CMS. And uh, Antonio is going to uh, give us that talk. So if you can set yourself up, Antonio. Yes. Okay. Yep, that looks perfect. So, uh, yeah. okay, I, I get started then. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, basically the, the CNS submission infrastructure and uh, the global pool of, of resources, how this pool has been expanding and, and becoming more complex uh, with time, and how it will be uh, even even more so going into the future. I will describe some ongoing and future work, which is modifying the aspect of this submission infrastructure and, and provide some, some conclusions. So the summary, uh, the submission infrastructure, uh, will refer to the submission infrastructure itself and also to the submission infrastructure team, which is leading this, this infrastructure, of course. So uh, we as a team within CMS uh, experiment, uh, um, what we do basically is run the, the computing infrastructure in which all processing, the construction, simulation, and analysis uh, of physics uh, and data takes place. Uh, so in order to do that, we manage a, a Condor pool, which is uh, created uh, via Glide WMS uh, submission of, of pilots. And then, of course, uh, our main uh, concern is also to communicate uh, the CMS priorities to the development teams, which provide us with this uh, with these tools, like Nevermess and, and Condor, of course. Um, our activities uh, basically are divided into, of course, uh, fighting the, the current problems, the current uh, fires, and, and getting the, the pool uh, to run stable, uh, preparing for future scale and also anticipate uh, future requirements, and uh, integrate new resources types uh, and, and, and diverse uh, job submission methods, uh, different that than what we have uh, presently. Um, this is the classical view of the pool. Um, it has two layers, basically on one side, there is the gliding WMS layer of the pool, which is uh, the side that creates the pool, and the other part is, is the Condor pool itself. So in creating the pool, there is a front end, which uh, queries the, the job scheduler uh, nodes, where basically all the jobs are accumulated, and on the basis of this job pressure, pilot jobs are submitted onto the resources, be it the grid cloud or, or whatever. Uh, once these uh, pilots, which are all multi-core, by the way, uh, start, they launch uh, a, the process, which is a, a Condor Start D. This Condor Start D connects uh, to the central manager of the pool. And of course, uh, this creates the pool itself. And then the negotiator can, can do the matchmaking between uh, jobs and, and, and resources. This is the the usual uh, pilot build uh, model of a pool. Um, now we have to, to, to do basically our, our most important task, of course, uh, besides building the pool, it's handling the workload scheduling. So in that we have to consider that we have uh, different type of requests, uh, data processing, Monte Carlo generation, detector data reconstruction, etc. And also, all these requests have different resource uh, requirements in terms of number of CPUs that they have to run. Maybe they, they need the uh, accelerator or they are prepared to run on accelerator, the amount of memory, uh, disk uh, and network I.O., et cetera. So each job has uh, requirements. So we have to do the scheduling, a good scheduling of all these types of requests. And of course, what good scheduling means can be interpreted and it's usually interpreted in a number of ways. So, 
We have to use all the resources efficiently. We have to respect the fair share between the, the groups. Uh, we have to respect the privatization. Uh, we have to minimize your failures. We have to provide flexibility in order that somehow, at some point in time, we can be able to, to handle some uncommon requests. So, for example, very high memory requests. Uh, and of course, uh, in the end, anything that is related to the TF0, so to the, the data processing, directly data processing, uh, needs to have the, the highest priority at CERN. So all these um, interpretations of good scheduling, of course, have a, a, a big overlap, but they are not uh, exactly the same. And we have to do our best to try to ensure that all these goals are reasonably covered, uh, and even under evolving scenarios uh, through the years. So some, some results or on how well we, we do this effort in, in scheduling. First plot on, on the top is actually showing the, the utilization of the resources. So it's all the resources in the pool are utilized at 95% in general. This is the typical utilization of the pool. Um, these other plots are showing how well we do the mix of the different uh, types of requests and how we satisfy the different customers, so to speak. So here you can see the fair share between analysis and production uh, with the same definitions used uh, before by, by the Adlax uh, uh, colleagues. Um, and then, for example, if you go into the production, of course, you have the different teams uh, analyzing uh, data for different uh, physics purposes, and you can uh, distinguish how this evolves with time based on priority, and we're satisfying, let's say, uh, B physics, Higgs, uh, tops, uh, analysis, etc. So, yeah. Um, we have uh, good scheduling, so to speak. We have a big pool and we have to, to handle it, even if uh, this uh, pool has been growing uh, through recent years. So over the past uh, three years or so, uh, the size of the pool has basically doubled. Uh, this is mostly driven by, by the increasing requests during the LSE run two. The Condor pool right now, it's around uh, 250,000 cores, uh, 300,000 cores uh, in the peak when we include also the, the CERN resources, which for stability reasons are uh, installed in a separated pool from the main global pool. And uh, it's also worth noticing that during the, the run to and, and, and long shunt two, we have been progressively adding more opportunistic or non-plex resources. So the most important in, in, in size is uh, of course the, the HLT farm. So the HLT farm has been commissioned for opportunistic resource for offline processing. And uh, of course, we have been using this fully during the, the shutdown. So there is an increasing proportion of uh, beyond pledge, uh, also HPC and cloud resources in the mix. I will describe this, this a bit uh, uh, further later on. So this has been the, the, the growth uh, so far. But of course, we, if we look into the future, especially for the high luminosity LHC, uh, well, this is, uh, I think, a well-known well story. Uh, in the case of CMS, the, the current um, projections anticipate uh, at least an order of magnitude uh, higher in the processing needs than the current values. Uh, this is, of course, increasing due to increasing trigger rates and even complexity. Uh, this pile up uh, 200, for example, working scenario. Uh, this growth factor is probably going to be reduced because there is a still ongoing work on, on improving uh, the software and improving the, the data formats. But nevertheless, uh, we need to consider that there will be um, a substantial growth in, in, in the amount of resources and how this will uh, affect the submission infrastructure and the uh, capability to do the workload scheduling. So one, F, uh, one aspect is that we are still running, even though we're running multi-core pilots, we are still running some fraction of single-core jobs, a non-negligible fraction of single-core jobs. This is expected to, give, to be completely uh, rid of or at least uh, very much reduced so that by then we can increase the uh, average number of, of, of calls per job and uh, essentially do more work with less uh, parallel tasks. Okay? Therefore, reducing the, the load on the infrastructure. Still, uh, there are questions. Uh, how big of a pool uh, will we need to, to manage uh, when we do when we have this uh, increased amount of resources, how many scheduler nodes will we need in order to handle such a load and, and, and keep continuously feeding this, this pool? And, and also, uh, again, consider that this uh, growth will likely not come from, from clear resources, but probably, most probably, from uh, other type of resources such as HPCs. 
So uh, in order to test the, the scalability of, of the pool and the stability and of the infrastructure, we continuously run uh, certain uh, stress tests on, on the pool. So we are continuously reassessing the improvement that we get uh, from both Glide LMS uh, and the Condor uh, uh, software packages. Um, of course, we will to, to, let's say, we try to break the pool, we try to see where is the maximum uh, load that it can achieve while still uh, retaining high efficiency in the utilization, which is uh, what we want to, to do, of course. So we have been pushing uh, for the highest uh, size of a single pool, trying to, to count the maximum number of, of, of jobs that we can run. And we have observed uh, that we can get up to 400,000 concurrent running jobs. Uh, mind you, this is running jobs, not CPU cores. Uh, so at the present uh, value, we have two uh, cores per job on average. So this would be uh, this double amount in, in, in total uh, amount of, of, uh, of CPU cores, which is a big increase with respect to the, to the current uh, uh, number of CPU that, that we handle. Uh, we have been exploring also the submission rate limits uh, of, the, of the scheduler nodes, and it's closer to the hertz uh, than to, to the 10 hertz uh, of, uh, values. Okay. Um, so yeah, we need to be careful on, on, on keeping the scalability of the pool. Uh, also because we have to deal with uh, this other element, the increasing complexity in the pool. So from the picture that I showed before of a single pool, um, in fact, we need to go to this uh, rather uh, cumbersome uh, picture in which we don't have a, we no longer have a single pool, but we have several of them. Uh, the global pool in the, in the center is the main one still. It handles the majority of the resources, but we have additional uh, accessory uh, pools which handle specialized resources too. And we have distributed scheduler nodes, uh, both at CERN and also at Fermilab, and they are connected in different ways to access all the resources in the, in the pool. Most of the resources are still acquired by submission of, of Glide WMS pilots, but now we have also vacuum model instantiated slots, for example, with this uh, DODAS uh, project, which are directly joining the pool. We also have uh, Boeing resources, uh, these opportunistic, um, which are kind of BMs, the DHLT, uh, BMs connecting directly to a pool, etc. And of course, the, the several components of, of HPCs. So coming to, to HPCs, uh, why are they important? Well, uh, the, we know that is, uh, there's going to be an increase in uh, usage of HPC resources, and this is because there is growing funding for HPCs. Uh, they are the different countries and, and yeah, and funding agencies are, are pushing to deploy in, uh, the, the exascale or near exascale machines. And uh, the same funding agencies are also pushing highly physics communities to make use of these resources because, of course, we have the computers, so we better use them. It's, that is interesting in our, in our part as well because, yeah, we not only use these resources as CPU, but also we will have access to different technologies, potentially, for example, uh, GPUs, which are and are going to be employed in, in HPCs. So, all in all, the HPC contribution to, to the future of our uh, computing, it's, uh, it has been acknowledged uh, to be a, an integral part of the WC strategy towards uh, the Hallam University LHC. And this is from a, from a talk uh, by Ian Bird uh, last autumn, where you can see the, the HPC included explicitly in the picture. So again, the same uh, picture I showed before, the, the complexity of the pool. And now you can see I'm explicitly noting where we get H and how we get uh, HPC resources included in, in the mix. So the main component is still right now is a grid-like uh, HPC. So we basically submit pilots to ASI. These pilots uh, get to start and then join the pool. This is the case, for example, for CSCS, Switzerland, or Chineca in Italy. We can think of uh, instantiating vacuum model slots in HPCs as well. And uh, the other major component so far for us is the HEP cloud. So the HEP cloud is uh, functioning as a federated pool to our global pool, but this is actually uh, decoupled in the management from, from CMS directly, and it's actually managed from Fermilab. So Fermilab HEP cloud is um, incorporating not only the, 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 the own resources at, at Fermilab, but also several um, HPC sites uh, in the US. And we have access to these sites in the US via HEP cloud. 
So some, uh, some words about uh, dynamic resources integration. So a lot of work has been done uh, recently in the integration of, of such resources into the global pool and more in general uh, for CMS use. So HPCs, we are now submitting pilots to Chineca uh, and we have uh, also help cloud uh, slots as well. Cloud, we are submitting to, to sites and these sites are passing on uh, as an extension of the site, they are passing on these pilots onto uh, cloud resources. For example, we have Azure uh, on CERN and we have also Amazon as an extension of, of PIC, the other one in Spain. Right. We have been using, sorry? Just three minutes more. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, we have been using new cluster. For example, you might have heard of this uh, beer resource as CERN. This is Batch on, on, Neos, uh, on Neos racks, let's say. And we have also access to standard research or university campus and resources, such as, for example, in KIT or Purdue University. And finally, we have the volunteer pool for CMS at home. So these two plots are showing basically all these components, how they are uh, already providing resources. So you can see, for example, here, uh, the main component in this beer, uh, certain beer running, um, can have Chineca also contributing with several peaks. And on this part, you have the, the head cloud uh, elements with several um, HPCs in the US, mostly NERSC, but also Comet and, and Bridges. Okay, uh, an important aspect is that uh, in order to use many of these resources which are non-standard, we need an enhanced uh, workload and uh, two resource matchmaking. So this means that we need an expanded description of both the jobs and the resources. Uh, for example, we know that some of these machines are actually running on, on KNL nodes and this uh, radically modifies the running time of the jobs. So we need to make additional selection of what type of jobs can run in these resources. Or for example, maybe some of the resources lack a direct access to a nearby storage. So we only can run uh, simulation tasks. So we need to, to, to go a bit farther in the uh, matchmaking of resources, uh, of, of resource to resources uh, for this type of uh, machines. A hard case, just to mention it, we have the, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, it's a big machine in Spain. It's the biggest machine in Spain. It's approaching the, it's it's going to be funded to approach the near scale um, uh, cluster uh, in a year, principally. Um, and the main point is that it's very hard environment because they have uh, many of the elements of communication that are needed for a pilot to work uh, are basically closed, uh, shut down. So we need to find alternatives and we have been working. Uh, the PIC uh, team, of which I, I am part, and the Condor team, uh, we have been working on a project to um, enable um, network isolated nodes to be incorporated into a pool for CMS use. Um, as I mentioned, and, and we have uh, discussed, a lot of the resources in the HPCs are going to be GPUs, and we need to be prepared for that. I want to call your attention to uh, the fact that Glide WMS and, and Condor are already providing us with tools to manage GPUs. For example, we have this tool for Condor GPU discovery that can run in, in our pilots. And we also have the proper, um, uh, let's say, language in order to do the matchmaking because jobs can already specify if they require GPUs or what type of, of, of additional requirements they have, for example, on the type of, of GPU or their capacity. Um, all our jobs are executed in, in singularity containers. Um, they all run in, in these containers within our jobs. And we have uh, specialized singularity containers for uh, TensorFlow workloads. And these are distributed by Symbian file system and supported by OSG. So CMS already has a small fraction of GPU resources in the global pool, mostly in the US sites. And also we have a, a method of submission of jobs, CMS Connect, which is a lightweight uh, WM entry point and uh, mainly for analysis jobs and already supports uh, requesting GPUs. So we are starting to, to get prepared for, for the use of GPUs, let's say. So, very quickly, ongoing and future work. Uh, we maintain the, the goals uh, and, and we continue working in, in this direction for submission infrastructure. So integration of grid resources, uh, non-grid resources, excuse me, uh, and the support for GPUs. We have been working a lot on improving our monitoring, uh, of course, in order to do our better job and, and also provide the better feedback to the, to the developers and where things are breaking, where we try to push uh, too hard. Improve the scheduling. For example, we have been uh, 
thinking about the tuning tasks after they have been modified. So this is modifying after they have been submitted. So this is modifying the job resource requests. Um, we are thinking and we are starting to, to work on, on deploying the infrastructure, not based on, on bare metal or, or VMs, but based on, on Kubernetes uh, containers. And we continue running the scalability and stability tests. Uh, for Condor, we are interested in, in uh, trying and we are already starting to test token-based authentication. Um, and it's interesting for us also the concept of jobs and resources, because this is potentially reducing combinatorics and allowing the, the, the infrastructure to grow. Glide WMS, uh, we continue using uh, Singularity. Uh, we are now move to native Singularity support from Glide WMS, and it's an important element uh, here to uh, allow the configuration of pilot entries from the Creek information. So Creek is the new information layer that CMS has adopted, and we are working on integrating these two elements. Just as an example of the very nice flexibility that we have in a pool, we very quickly were able to integrate uh, folding at home uh, jobs to run against uh, COVID-19 in our pool. It was a matter of, uh, of uh, hours, let's say, to uh, wrap the, the folding at home uh, um, element into some wrappers for Condor and submit them directly into the pool. So this not only uh, we, we intend to, to have helped in the fight against COVID-19, but it also demonstrated nice things about the pool. Lessons were learned about uh, how we can seamlessly handle uh, non-CMS applications and, and new applications, and this will be useful for the future CMS process, uh, processing. For example, in backfilling grid slots with lower priority CMS jobs, which is what we did with the folding at home tasks that you can see here uh, at a very small fraction of the pool, but nevertheless, they are, they are filling the holes that are left uh, by our main production and analysis workflow. So in conclusion, uh, what we deal with, uh, with is the resource provisioning and workload scheduling for CMS. Good scheduling has multiple criteria and we have to work to cover uh, all of them or most of them. Um, CMS uh, has, been expect, uh, has been growing in resources and expects uh, increasing scales onwards looking to the future and more a complex mix of resources. So we need to be prepared to access different resources of the dark grid and to be able to use them. Uh, like I mentioned, these, these GPUs. We are uh, working hard always to detect uh, potential bottlenecks into the infrastructure and to assess the scalability of, uh, of our tools. So um, yeah, we work uh, on the integration on, on non grid resources, especially HPCs and, and in particular for sites such as the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which is a, a hard environment. And uh, we are integrating in many of these resources already. Um, yeah, so the ongoing and future work is dedicated to uh, continually providing CMS infrastructure with further flexibility and reach. And as usual, I, I want to finish acknowledging the, the effort and the support that we get uh, from the client WMS and uh, Condor developer teams, as well as CNIT, of course, for the support uh, and collaboration. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Antonio. And apologies, so, I ran uh, a bit uh, longer. Well, you were also the last speaker, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, there's a, there's a question from Giri, so we could maybe take a couple of quick questions. Thanks. We can't hear you, Giri. Is it, is it better now? Yeah. Okay, so. I would like to ask you about continuous scaling tests. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that you were running more than 400,000 concurrent running jobs. Mm -hmm. Was it on some special test bed where you run several hundreds or maybe thousands of jobs uh, on, one, on one server? So you just need few servers or was it on the real infrastructure? The question is, if it was only on some test infrastructure, it's how a, I, yeah. How are you sure that in the real life where rounded types to many sites is much higher that it would uh, behave the, sa the same as for this test? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, we are actually, we're actually distributing the load over the whole grid. So what we do is we create this Uber glidings. So instead of one core being uh, one, one gliding, so to speak, or one batch of, of, of CPUs being one gliding, we basically overload 
our pilots to instantiate multiple studies. So they are distributed uh, over the world. However, they have this uh, additional multiplying factor. And of course, the jobs are dummy jobs in the sense that they don't produce uh, an overload of, on the machines. But the fact that, of, that we are running uh, sometimes even uh, 32 of them uh, at the same time for a, single, for a single CPU. So it's distributed. So we are covering for that effect. Uh, of course, we are not, uh, we don't have uh, 400,000 CPU cores <laughs> at our disposal this, uh, or even higher than that. So it's a bit, uh, we are mimicking that by, by this trick of the Uber gliding, but nevertheless, it's, it is a still a distributed infrastructure over the whole grid. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Antonio. And any final question someone wants to ask? Okay, I don't see anything. So uh, my thanks to Mikhail and Nicola and Antonio for their contributions um, in the last of our session. And that in fact uh, brings the track 14 parallel sessions to a close. So I'd like to thank all of the speakers um, both in this session and in the three previous sessions. And uh, with that, I think we can let everybody go for lunch and very much hope that you enjoy the, the rest of ICHEP 2020. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.